Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Councillor Ruth McEwen and I'm the Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, just before we start the meeting, I have an announcement. I would like to inform everyone present that this meeting will be recorded and broadcast live in Microsoft Teams and will then be uploaded and available for repeat viewing on the Council's website. You should be aware that the Council is a data controller under the Data Protection Act. Data collected during a webcast will be retained in accordance with the Council's published policy. I'm afraid that due to current technical limits in the Council Chamber, not all the members of the board physically present will necessarily be able to be seen on camera, but should you be able to hear anybody if they, you should be able to hit you, hear everybody if they use their microphones. The seating in the public gallery will not be filmed. Members of the public are only able to speak if they've submitted a formal question in accordance with the council procedure rules. Please could councillors, officers and partners attending introduce themselves before they speak at the meeting for the benefit of the public. And just to help me manage the meeting, if any members of the board attending online wish to speak during the meeting, please can you indicate your wish to speak by raising an electronic hand in Teams, but also verbal, indicate verbally, e.g. E Chair, can I speak? This will help us to avoid missing your requests. Those members in the chamber can indicate their, indicate their wish to speak by raising a physical hand as usual. And when not speaking, all online attendees should put their microphones on mute and switch off their cameras. If called to speak, please switch on your camera and unmute your microphone and pause for about three seconds to allow for the slight time delay in connection. Thank you very much. And so on with the agenda. Um, the first um, agenda item is declaration of interest. So none declared. Um, agenda item two, minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of January 2024. Is everybody happy to approve the minutes? Yep. OK, and questions, uh, agenda item three, questions. And we have a question from um, Jamie Gordon, <coughs> who I understand is here. Would you like to come up to the table, Jamie, and read out your question? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for coming along today. You'll need to put your mic on, please. Thank you very much. Uh, like this. Right. OK, so um, hello, uh, my name is Jamie. Um, I'm an ambassador for ADHD UK in Reading. Uh, my question today relates to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the lack of post-diagnostic support for individuals with ADHD and the wait time from when a person first speaks to their GP about ADHD until they receive a confirmation of an ADHD assessment. Adults with ADHD are five times more likely to take their own life than those without ADHD. One quarter of women with ADHD have tried to take their own life. One in 10 men with ADHD have tried to take their own life. It's also believed that 25% of adults in the criminal justice system have ADHD. 0.5 adults in the general population. In Berkshire, there is a three year waiting list from when an adult or child discusses ADHD with their doctor to when they are granted an ADHD assessment. If someone is coming to Berkshire from elsewhere in the country, there is an additional two year waiting list for a medication review that, de that determines whether your original diagnosis is recorded, is recognised or not. It is a similar story for those who choose to go for a private assessment. So I've got three questions for the panel today, and that is, to what extent are you aware of these problems? What is being done to raise awareness across all sectors about these issues? And is there anything being done to tackle the three year waiting lists for ADHD assessments amongst adults and children? Thank you very much for your question. Um, OK, I've got, I've got a response here, so if you, um, I'm sure, I know you've had a copy, so I'll read through the response for you. Um, waiting times. Below is the picture wide, Berkshire wide. Weights can vary as some assessments 
will be prioritised due to high levels of clinical need or risk. Children, young, with children and young people with ADHD at the end of February, 10% have been waiting for more than two years. The average wait for those who were seen in February was 104 weeks. Adult ADHD, of those seen 22, 23, 20, 24 to date, the majority of those seen, and that's 59%, had a wait of two to three years, with 33% waiting less than two years. However, 8% waited longer than three years. Transfer, transfer from another NHS provider or from a private provider. When a young person or adult taking ADHD medication transfers from another NHS provider or wishes to move their care to the NHS from a private set from a private provider, the assessment report is reviewed, providing it contains all of the information we need. The wait for a medication appointment will be up to 18 months for children, young people, and over a year for adults. If a report does not contain all of the information required to make decisions about medication, then the wait will be the same as for a new assessment. The GP will usually be able to continue prescribing ADHD medication while they wait for an appointment. Unfortunately, we are not able to prioritise appointments on the basis of a private provider having started ADHD medication. When a private provider in initiates medication, the responsibility for monitoring and reviewing this remains with them until we can offer an appointment. To what extent are you aware of these problems? The system is very aware of the issues affecting ADHD services. Referrals have long outstripped the service capacity and this has resulted in large numbers, large numbers waiting and long waits. This is a national picture with services across the country facing similar pressures and waits being measured across the country in years, with waits of up to 10 years being reported in some cases. This is combined with additional pressures from COVID-19 and a national shortage of qualified staff. The recent global shortage of ADHD medication has also placed additional pressures on the services. The service understands how difficult waits can be for children and young people and adults, and reducing the waiting time remains a top priority with a great deal ongoing work. It is essential for Berkshire Healthcare Buckinghamshire, Oxford and Berkshire Integrated Care Board, that's the Bob and ICB, and partners to work together to respond to the challenges. What is being done to raise awareness across all sectors about these issues? We work in the system to emphasise the importance of early needs led support, which does not need to rely or wait on, on a foreign assessment. In terms of the support on offer, we are fortunate that in Berkshire, much of the same support and advice that is available after a diagnosis is also available before an assessment. Children and young people. Our website has Getting Help Now information for families that is also sent out. In the west of Berkshire, the NHS commissioned Children and Young People's Autism and ADHD Support Service is delivered by Autism Berkshire and Parenting, Parenting Special Children and provides a wide range of support, including advice, workshops and courses, which are all available to families at any point. Further information is available on their website which is um, autismberkshire.co.uk, Berkshire West Autism ADHD Support Service. NICE guidelines recommend permanent advice and training programmes follow an ADHD diagnosis, and families are in fact able to access this even prior to the assessment through this service, and this includes a series of linked workshops. Workshop one, introduction to ADHD, what is ADHD, challenges and concerns, strengths and opportunities and signposting to support. Workshop two, anxiety and ADHD, ADHD, what is anxiety, what is the relationship between ADHD and anxiety, coping strategies for children and young people and parents and carers. Workshop three, managing ADHD behaviours, attention deficit behaviours, hyperactive behaviours, impulsive behaviours and behaviour management strategies. The need to provide support as early as possible as the young person's needs will be the same, will be the same the day after an assessment as the day before. This includes free uh, PPEP care training, 
to empower settings to understand and meet needs. Neurodiversity newsletters provide updates to families and other stakeholders. The Adult ADHD Service offers signposting to online support guides that offer behavioural and psychological strategies to support ADHD symptoms, including education, work, sleep, managing mood, relationships, etc. And on, on, and on a demand webinar. All of these resources are available at any point, including prior to an assessment and or without a referral. System collaboration. Berkshire Healthcare has also been collaborating with other service providers across the region to share learning and innovation to respond to the challenges that are being faced by all services. Within Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire Integrated Care Board, we have projects underway for both young people, children, young people and adult ADHD services to determine the most effective assessment models and pathways. This includes the role of artificial intelligence in supporting assessments and a pilot of Spencer 3D in schools, which is a digital tool to profile and support identified needs in schools, which can happen with or without an assessment or referral. Is there anything being done to tackle the three year waiting list for ADHD, ADHD assessments amongst adults and children? An ongoing programme of quality improvement and service transformation is in place. In addition, both children and young people's and adult services have worked in partnership with private providers to increase the number of appointments offered. However, referrals have also increased. Below is some of the work currently underway. Children and young people's ADHD. Increasing capacity. Despite the national shortage of qualified staff, the service has been able to recruit to a number of new posts. We have also offered a number of weekend clinics. Quality improvement. Current, current projects include improvements to the referral process, reducing DNAs, concluding assessments as, in as few appointments as possible, and going reviewing of a review of processes to identify and implement ways to further increase productivity while providing good clinical quality and family experience, automating tasks to re release more clinical and administrative capacity, ongoing review of skill mix required for tasks to reduce the impact of the national shortage of qualified professionals. Adult ADHD service, referral and triage process, the adult ADHD and autism triage process ensures that clients referred to the service are provided with avenues for support as well as links to support with mental health to all clients referred to the service. Reducing weight for annual ADHD medication review. Additional short term funding has been provided to reduce the weight for an annual medication review. Quality improvement. Current projects include improving the transition for CYP to reduce weights to be seen after transfer to the adult service and improve support experience. Thank you. Can I ask if you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm not, I'm not sure if anybody um, would that to respond that I'll, we could. Yeah, we can take that away and get back to you on that. But thank, thank you, you very you. much for coming today and thank you for your um, a really good question. So thank you very much. No worries. Thank you very much. So um, moving on with the uh, agenda. Agenda item four, petitions. We don't have any petitions. We're moving on to agenda item five, which is the community wellness outreach project 
to update and we have um Bev and we've got quite a few people here so I'm not sure if you, you want to introduce yourselves or do you want to start by Bev and we've got uh, Dr Tricia Bennett and Rachel Spencer and Katie Pritchard Thomas nope 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 sorry 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 Sharon Herring so I couldn't see you in there Sharon thank you very much for coming everybody thank you oh, thank you very much Councillor McEwen um yes I've got colleagues here working who have been working on the project uh, just to share some of their thoughts about it and we've got a slide about that at, towards the end so thank you very much um this is quite an exciting project I must admit and um we're all looking forward to um to sharing this with you so I'm just going to share screen Oh yeah, sorry. I think my laptop's in the way, isn't it? <laughs> Let me move it around here a little bit. Is that better? There we go. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, I'm just going to run through a short presentation uh, just to show you some outcomes that we've had um, so far. I'm going to pop it in a uh, slideshow view just so you get a good picture of it. It's very slow to respond today. Right. <laughs> so Community Violence Outreach Programme, which is a collaborative programme across Berkshire West, um, and this is about the Reading specific model um, and what's led to us developing this service. So this this is the um, the funding split. So the funding was an inequalities fund that came down from government through the Integrated Care Board. Um, and they're just an indication of the uh, split of funding um, and how that's being spent. And in Reading, uh, we were given 811,000 across two years um, with an extension to the end of June in terms of activity um, so that we could deliver 5,200 checks, um, health checks across uh, Reading. And our model includes uh, wraparound care as well. And I just wanted to share the governance structure of this because it's quite complex. <laughs> but just for reassurance that um, this has gone through many boards, um, we had a number of different work stream uh, running in the early stage of the project. I'm glad to say we've now condensed that down to one project meeting a week and hopefully moving to monthly shortly. Um, but there's a, a huge amount of governance around this and reporting back to our colleagues in the integrated care board and working with our primary care colleagues as well. The driver um, for us delivering this model in Reading was some health check data that we had for Reading that showed that there were particular um, groups who were disadvantaged, who were at high risk of um, poor health outcome, particularly cardiovascular disease, which is the focus of the project. Um, who had not had a health check. Um, and so that's been one of the drivers. And we were also looking at the core 20 plus five group. So 20% most deprived areas um, and five groups of um, other people that would be disadvantaged. So those identified in the system that may be homeless with a learning disability, had left military service, for instance, asylum seekers, um, maybe released from prison recently uh, and requires some support for social inclusion or communication. Um, and because the locations it, our, the work is being delivered in, we are reaching those groups of people. Apologies, this is a bit of a wordy one, so I'm not going to read it word for word, but um, basically we're asked to implement an outreach service um, quite rapidly um, to start reaching into communities and delivering those NHS health checks, but with wraparound support from our community partners so that there would be mental health support, there'd be debt advice, there'd be food advice, um, a whole range of different support for people's well-being. Um, so it's not just about the health check, that's what brings them there, but they also get a wraparound support service as well. Um, and the Royal Berkshire Hospital, our colleagues in the uh, Meet Pete team, so patient engagement and experience team, um, we're already running a programme in our communities, working in collaboration with Reading Voluntary Action um, to provide some mini health checks. So we wanted to build on what they were already doing in the community um, 
and it just mean it just meant adding some extra aspects of um, to make it the full NHS health check. And we already had the expertise there because it's a team of nurses that are delivering those uh, checks. Um, and with Reading Voluntary Action, obviously there are community partners, so they've got that engagement with all the community uh, grassroots organisations that can support um, as well. Um, and we also made use of the JOY platform, the social prescribing platform, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of um, by now. We do try and promote it in every every opportunity, um, but it's really, really uh, proving to be beneficial. So the programme in Reading is available to all people over the age of 18. It prioritises people from those communities and those groups that I mentioned earlier. Um, and may, um, people that have not had a health check or unidentified uh, long term condition because they're already being managed. So this is a slide from our uh, one of our colleagues presentations, but I felt it was important about the engagement. So the data shows that, you know, people in lower deciles in the deprivation index are significantly more likely to attend A&E, more likely to be admitted as inpatients, more likely to have longer waits for outpatient appointments and more likely to not attend appointments. And we know that particularly community groups are disproportionately affected, um, especially in terms of their health care. So more likely have poorer experience, harder to access our services and need our services to adapt to meet their needs. And so this adaptation, providing this in the communities, um, we think will be really significant in terms of improving outcomes for people. So it's just a screenshot here of the uh, the web page of the calendar events um, running in March. So we've got the web page up and running and shortly we'll be releasing the appointment booking opportunity, which I'm sure Rachel will talk about um, later in the presentation. But it's running really well and people can just click through to the website, get as much information as they want. There's also a contact telephone number that they can ring if they want to talk to somebody about it. Um, and the lovely thing about the web page is that no matter where somebody is going, it actually gives some information about how parking and bus routes and other useful information that will help them to get there. And really just talking about adopting the public health approach. So, um, you know, the NHS health check data will be auto sorry, automatically updated um, to the GP record system once they've had their health check. So it's linking in, using that um, the data in a really effective way so that there are timely alerts um, for GPs and onward referrals. If somebody hasn't registered with a GP, then there's help to do that. And we've had some people already through the system who have been helped to register with the GP. Um, and it also enables them to take away their outcomes of their check. So they'll have a card where they can take away uh, the results of their check. Or if they want to have that information digitally, they will be able to do that as well. So whichever really suits their needs. And we looked at this data, so the percentage of population by ethnic group for Reading from the census, uh, 2021 census. Um, and it showed that there's a much larger proportion of people from Indian, Pakistani, Asian or African ethnicity in Reading compared to the whole of England. Um, and we also know that black, Asian and other minority ethnic groups are at higher risk of particular conditions like diabetes, um, other health conditions um, that actually mean that they're more at risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and diabetes is a key risk condition in de developing cardiovascular disease. And the recent Health Observatory uh, reported that South and Asian and black people are two to four times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than white people. 40% of South Asians have a higher death rate from coronary heart disease and 24% of all deaths in England and Wales were caused by cardiovascular disease in black and minority ethnic groups. So all of that brings us to our results so far. So we found that 38% of our um, the group of people that we've seen already were outside the usual age range for an NHS health check. So the normal age range would be 40 to 74. Um, so 13% were age 75 plus and 25% were below aged 40. And the below age 40 is a particular focus for um, OHID, the Office of, Office of Health and um, Inequalities. So that was really important. In terms of the ethnicity, 37% of the people attending sessions were from an Asian or Asian British ethnic background. So given that they're in really high risk groups, we were really pleased with this um, as an outcome. Um, 
193 people had been seen as at the end of February. I'm sure it's many more now. <laughs> um, and you know we're building the capacity, so we are now able to see 15 to 20 patients per session, five sessions a week, um, plus larger events that are planned, which um, gives us a bit more confidence in being able to re reach that very large target of 5,200. And so the outcomes in Reading, we need to achieve 5,200 NHS health checks. We had a soft launch of the service in December. Um, we were the first to launch across Berkshire West. Um, and whilst the resources were being, uh, you know, equipment being uh, ordered and being tested and the team getting to know how to use that equipment, that's why we went with a soft launch. We didn't want to have a massive comms campaign because we didn't want people queuing around the block and then, you know, that disadvantaging the project in terms of reputation. Um, we are increasing the awareness of the impact of cardiovascular disease as a result of this, um, an opportunity to prevent um, and manage conditions effectively, we're increasing the number of health checks and particularly for more disadvantaged groups. So those aligned to that core 20 plus five health inequalities programme. Uh, referring people identified as being at risk to appropriate services and then the follow up for that, which is so important. It's not just an onward referral. There's a follow up to check. Did that happen? What was the outcome? How are you feeling now? Um, and to provide other support in relation to issues impacting on well-being, because somebody's health and well-being isn't just about the health check. It's them as a whole person. Um, and to hear from people in our community about their experience of the health check and, and the programme, the outreach programme, and ultimately identify some academic research opportunities um, that will arise uh, through the programme. And we just thought this was a really lovely statement um, that came back from one of the community health champions that um, somebody had said to them, they just got back to the centre and a lady had just thanked them for the health check as angina, cholesterol and high blood pressure were picked up um, and she's now seeing a consultant. So that really demonstrates how effective this programme is and that isn't the only person that's been picked up. Um, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will share as well uh, their experiences. So I just wanted to say the voice of our teams. Sadly, we haven't got Dr. Lizzie Mottram here today, who's our project clinical lead. Um, although uh, perhaps Dr. Andy Chichewski might want to say something about the programme. Um, but I'm going to hand you over to Sharon Herring uh, for her thoughts about the experience so far. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Um, I think the project's a really important project and the fact that we're all working together is just um, is, is amazing because it hasn't really happened like this before. The fact that we, you know, we as an acute trust can now access the results of these patients into GP records um, and, and working collaboratively. So I think that's really important. These um, clients that we see when we're out in the community are really, really complex. Um, and it takes a lot to actually um, get them to talk to us and work with us and take things forward. Um, and I know uh, Tricia may talk about a couple of examples in a minute, but one of our ladies that we met over in Whitley Wood took nearly a year um, to actually open up to us and talk about her, her past. Um, and then we could understand some of the reasons why she had the, the health problems that she had. So, by no means are any of these patients quick, easy, a quick health check, and then they're gone. That whole wraparound service is really, really important. And I think I just would like to um, emphasise that. A um, couple of examples that we've had literally over the last couple of weeks. Um, Launchpad, we're talking um, to a homeless chap and... Um, it was interesting. He was in the queue to have his health check and he kept saying to everyone else in the queue, you go before me, you go before me. Um, didn't really want to sit down and work with us. I think that building that trust is a really, really important thing for some of these people because historically they just don't want to engage with us as healthcare professionals. Um, eventually we did we did um, get him to, to join us and the mental health um, access that this poor chap required um, that he hadn't been able to tell us about before or tell anyone about um, was was really quite sad. Um, but we managed to get him some support going forward um, and, and move that case forward. His his actual NHS health check was absolutely fine. 
he was he was fine you know that would go through abs- you know with no no other follow up but it was a lot around that mental health issue um another lady this week young lady um came over um as an asylum seeker pregnant had a baby over here um struggling with money um brought the baby in and the baby was too big for the pram um again she had a health check she was fine um but the baby was squidged in a pram that was not the not appropriate size so we managed to facilitate that and get her another pram so again it's that wraparound support that is is really really key on the clinical side we've picked up a couple of um, atrial fibrillations which can go on to lead to stroke um, over the last month and we've had a few referrals into cardiology which again which has been um, good i will hand over to trisha for more Thank you, Sharon. Um, I just wanted to give a couple of examples from the Whitley end of things. It's really exciting for us to have other people come in and talk. People that our community in the past would have been a bit frightened of, in awe of, whatever it is that stops people getting to. There's always a reason never to get the doctor. Um, always a reason to see other people before yourself. But the fact that people are already at the hub and then the health people are coming in it's a no brainer, really. And with the trust we've built, and I think that's the key. I've written that in big letters and I write that in big letters everywhere I go. It's about trust because not everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, me, me, me. I'll go for a me. Me, Pete have been coming to us for nearly two years. I had a health check last Monday. I've never had so many red marks for a long time. And I just then reinforce what a lot of our people are saying. It's great to have a health check. We love it. We've had meet Pete. We see them month after month. So we say, can you just check my weight? Or I'm a bit worried. How's my blood pressure? And the fear is that we have just one off check. So we have to find a way to match the two. So a bit of a plea from our side is don't give people something and then take it away with a bit of paper that says, there you are, that's your results. It'll all be fine or it might not be. Just keep that ongoing check. Somebody they trust, somebody they trust outside the family. We all know our most difficult demons aren't the easiest to talk to about our nearest and dearest. We sometimes need to talk to people that are, diff- you know, that are separate. And the meet Pete nurses are amazing for that. They're real friends to us, non-judgmental, but they also have a bit of authority. So because someone's in the uniform, a lot of people feel safer talking to them. So we have I've got an example for you. Mr. D, he's a bin man. His wife works for us and they won't mind me talking about them because they know I will. Um, they're really busy. They're busting a gut to keep their heads above water. You know, he's doing every hour overtime. She's working three jobs. And she persuaded him to come at the in at the end of a shift and get a check. He's diabetic. He didn't know he was diabetic. It's not an old man, mid fifties. It's a ticking time bomb. And he'd been merrily going about his life. Never got the doctors because you know, tomorrow, another day when I'm ill, because you don't know you're ill if you've got early type two diabetes. And it was a wake up call for him. Life's changed significantly for them. He's now getting the help he needs. But he went in before me for his health check on Monday and he said it was a wake up call again. I'd slipped a little bit. And the fact that there was somebody there and he came in, a bit of a nagging from the wife probably, but that's good. We all need that. And um, he went in and he's back on the straight and narrow again. But without this kind of service, that's all of us doing it together. People we trust, people that people have said to me, oh, are they your friends, Tricia? I say, yeah, oh, I'll see them then because if they're your friends, that will be OK then. And that's actually the level we're operating at. We're operating at if people, if I trust people, then people that trust me will then take part in that service. So many different examples. I could talk all day about the examples, but it's fab because we can then be there to pick up the pieces afterwards as well about you know, I needed a stiff drink, probably, that was a red on my thing um, after Mondays. But that's what community is about. That's where it's got to be integrated. And this is really, really exciting. Everybody thinks Whitley's just down the road from the Royal Barts, isn't it? It's easy. The loads of doctor surgeries around. Life's much more complicated than that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel Spencer, Reading Voluntary Action. Um, 
just following on really from what Tricia has said and also an update on the numbers. So as of this morning, we've seen 267 people. So there is an increase, but most of the work is ahead of us yeah. as well. But fortunately, most of the resources ahead of us too. So um, the people that we've seen so far have absolutely fitted those priority groups that were set by the ICB. And I think that the challenge for us is to make sure that we don't lose sight of that because we've got that such a big number ahead of us. Um, and that's been done through mostly through relationships, as Tricia has just outlined, the word of mouth through voluntary sector organisations that have got those relationships, whether it's Launchpad with people, you know, like rough sleepers or people at risk of homelessness, neighbourhood groups like WCDA and Weller, ACA and RCLC, the Forgotten British Gurkhas, all of those organisations um, have been able to engage people, bring them along for a check and also be there afterwards to, to support them. Um, but we are conscious as well of the numbers ahead and thinking about how can we raise the profile of the project without the hubs being absolutely inundated with people. The, the check is now longer than it was previously because of the different additional aspects of it being a full check. Um, so you can very quickly have quite a long waiting um, queue of people and we will lose people if they're coming and it, they have to hang around for an hour and a half. So um, what, what we've done at RVA is we've introduced an online booking system, which I know does go against slightly what we've just described, <laughs> but it's it's trying to find diverse ways of doing things. So it's something for everybody. So that booking system will at the most will only be 50% of any slots at any venue. And we would imagine that a lot of those slots will actually be somebody supporting that person. So it'd be another professional, but it, it's a way of, you know, with the Forgotten British Gurkhas, they can then plan their sessions ahead. They can get people on the system and people then know what time their slot is and they don't have to, you know, wait or be anxious. They know exactly what's what's going to happen. So that's going live as of Monday. Um, so my plea is don't press on the <laughs> links that you've got for the, for the RVA calendar this afternoon because we're actually going through a process of upgrading that to introduce the online booking system. And... The significant additional traffic that we're expecting next week, ever the optimist. <laughs> um, so, but by Monday, please do have a look at those links um, and uh, yeah, make an appointment if that applies to you. Um, <coughs> what else was I going to say? We've also working very closely with primary care and the PCNs um, and primary care colleagues will be sending out messages to eligible patients to make them aware that the project is running um, and we'll be encouraging them to either go to the online system and make an appointment themselves if that's something that they're capable of doing but we've also got a helpline so they can, there'll be the number on there as well and they can phone up find out more about the project or find out where to go and a booking can be made for them if if need be um, so we have that uh, ahead of us um, as Bev has mentioned, another really positive part of the project is the increasing development um, embedding of joy within Reading, but also now across the whole of Berkshire West, which really is, as a result of this, has been a kind of catalyst for that, for that change. And the significant for us in the voluntary sector is evidencing um, what happens to people when they have an opportunity to make changes in their life. There's an opportunity to change that trajectory where they might be heading towards those poor health outcomes, that they actually get a chance and some support to make those changes. Um, and joy helps us to be able to, tr you know, to follow that and track that activity and evidence that impact. Because as we know, we all know, you know, that the prevention is best for that person, for their family, for all the systems um, and for all of us. So that's another sort of really positive outcome from the project as well oh and I was going to say and also what fabulous partnership work all held together by the amazing Bev <laughs> say thank that. you yeah <laughs> thank you very much that's the end of our presentation any questions uh, before we sort of go to questions I just want to say um thank you very much firstly for all coming in but it's a really impressive report very interesting to hear about the work that's happening. I know um, colleagues have indicated they want to speak, so um, I just want to say that first. And Councillor Gittings. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair, and and thanks, guys, for the um, for the for the presentation. And so, Trish, you need to get them all down to the Whitley Cafe, there. You know, sell them a nice cup of tea, and then uh, then have you 
have your have your health check as well. But look, it, I think this is it is brilliant. But blimey, it it's really needed. I mean, health inequality is one of the um, is 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 a massive is is a massive issue. And the Marmot review in 2010 identified this as a problem. Uh, and here we are, 14 years onward, and it's actually got worse. In fact, significantly worse. And that's as a result, you know, to crank of austerity cuts to public health spending and other factors, not to mention obviously COVID. Um, so there, this is this is a massive problem and actually health health outcomes are, are probably significantly worse than the life expectancy is stalling, which is the first time in a generation. I mean, it's a gloomy picture, but I mean, projects like this do, do give, you know, some some hope actually that things can be can be can be turned 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 around. And I think it's right that it's done at the community level. And Rachel very kindly gave us a briefing on the Joy app at my adult social care briefing actually this week. And I have to say I'm very excited by that because people going to the doctors, a lot of the time, to be quite honest with you, it's not they're not necessarily suffering from some terrible illness, but it's a probably some sort of lifestyle thing brought on obviously by the by the pressures of, as you say, Tricia, of, of work you know, hand to mouth existence, you haven't got a lot of time to, you know, to worry about your own health and your diet and things like that. So you, know, this, it, you go to the primary care setting and then obviously you're then referred to um, to, to to another setting. And I mentioned also to, to Rachel in our briefing that in, in the sports arena, East Riding Council and others, when people go in for a primary care checkup, they're then they're then sent down to our you know to a local set sports centre you know maybe for a bit of a fitness check stuff like that it's not for everybody but that that can work as well so I think this the, and Sport England as well are working on this with, with what they call pivots where in one sports centre there was 500 people came for a health check in Wigan just recently so there there is a lot of stuff that can be done that coordinated using actually fun enough our leisure centres our, our our other community centres for the settings think a little bit out of the box would be my thoughts because my sort of question was going to be and Rachel did touch on this around the targets we're going to do 5,200 and we've done 250 it's quite a big gap and so how realistically are we going to do, do to to meet that can this be extended Shall I answer that because I, I which would be gallant yeah. um it's going to be it's going to be a challenge one of the things I didn't say actually is that um there will be increased capacity and support for the voluntary organizations that are involved because we do know that that is the most effective way so it is taking different routes so there's that sort of core cool partner but also the wider voluntary sector and that voice and support and encouraging people to to get involved but we know that we can do it we can do it so we just it's keeping the momentum the risk is that we go for the numbers and we lose sight of the target and we absolutely mustn't do that mm -hmm. and we're all absolutely determined that that won't happen yeah thank you um we've got another question and that's alice who's on line <laughs> hi yes. can you hear me Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. This is not a question. It's just to say that um, as Health Watch, we sort of scoped to see how this project is doing indirectly. And I would turn on and say the feedback that we've had has been really positive in the sense that the time the nurses are giving to the clients has been very positive because going to a GP service is only a 10 minute uh, appointment. So they felt that they were they were listened to. So that was a, a, a positive thing that came out of it as well. And also the, the other thing that was also the fact that you are increasing awareness about the potential of, you know, if, if you um, looked at this check, if you did this check, the, you know, you're trying to prevent things was an awareness for the, the client as well. So they felt that, and, oh gosh, I did not know this. So there was an education part of it as well, which is good. The thing that I will also say was the fact that the, um, there was an interpreter who could interpret for the client was also a positive uh, thing as well. So they felt that the face-to-face was a good thing. So I think there's a lot of potential for this pro and it, it's a good project. And I my anxiety is the fact that, or my uh, is the fact that it is a pilot and how you know we need to somehow sustain this because we are now getting the the pub uh, the community to trust this project. We need to find a way to sustain it. 
Thank you, Alice. Um, do we have anybody else that wanted to speak? Um, Melissa? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say how thrilled I am to hear the update. I was so excited about this project and it's so wonderful to hear all of you today presenting that um, <laughs> partnership picture. And, and Councillor Gitting's point, you know, this is key in terms of health inequalities and some of our key focus wards in Reading around Church and Whitley. I mean, this is just fantastic and so needed. And as Rachel said, what a fabulous example of collaboration and joined up work and us all bringing our skills to the mix to achieve fabulous outcomes. Um, I would echo that point just made about sustainability because Trisha mentioned about trust and you start building this, you start building expectation. Um, and we're clearly proving that this method is really um, having an impact. Um, so, um, and I know that's not easy in this context, but um, you know, if, if ever this is a proof of concept, here it is. Um, my point was really about clarification, Rachel, to you. So I think some of the power of this is that combination between drop-in, that kind of opportunistic drop-in, versus digital stuff. So I just wanted some reassurance that clearly you've got to manage the numbers. Um, but I, I would be worried if we went, it all needed to be kind of pre-planned and online, because I think sometimes you capture people, the point about the gentleman that works on the binge, you know, oh, I'm just going to drop in. So I, I want to be assured of that, please. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why we've not been as high profile about the project is that fear of, of the venues being overrun. But actually, the two go, do go hand in hand because we'll have the online booking. It means that we can sh we can be really loud about it because we know that there will be an avenue for people to be able to book for their future appointments. But alongside that, they'll be aware of it. They'll know it's down the road and there will be an increase in people just coming along and being able to come in and say, OK, well, it's not time today for you, but you can make an appointment for your next lunch hour, that kind of thing. So the two do go hand in hand. So we re really significantly increase the awareness um, as a result of having the online booking. It's more of a safety valve, to be honest, so that people don't go away disappointed. Yeah. Trisha. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree. I think we need to mix and match both. I think, however, we might be at risk of what happens everywhere else, that the people that are already coming to services like ours are the very most vulnerable. So we really have to work hard to get them because I think if we advertise it really wide and big early on, we'll get the usual suspects. We'll get the people who turn up for everything. The first people to sign up for COVID vaccinations, the first people for anything that's free or a value or a meeting or whatever. And we have to be really, really careful from where I sit to make sure that we get the most most vulnerable who won't sign up for anything who don't who could never click in for um, a covid check-in because they didn't have a phone that did it that kind of thing the people that don't even know that we can talk to over a cup of tea because they came in for a loaf of bread today from the surplus so it's a really fine balance meeting targets and getting to the most vulnerable is heavy going but we will do it yeah thank you um, John has got a question, our point. Well, um, Melissa really said most of the things that I would say. I just would like to underline that and reinforce it. You know, 80%, um, 90% of the population see a GP at least, you know, once, twice, three, four, five, six times a year. So most of this kind of stuff ought to be part of routine general practice. Uh, in an ideal world and hopefully in a future which uh, respects primary care more than it does at the moment, that would be the case. But it's the remaining ones um, that really we've got to reach and, and that's why it's so uh, rewarding to hear the sentiments that people have been expressing because I think they're really, there's a real insight and wisdom and grasp here about what's needed. Um, this is about, it's a kind of Heineken thing it's reaching the parts that the others don't reach. So it's a kind of Heineken initiative. I think perhaps we should, if we're if we allowed to mention alcohol in the context of public health, but that's what it's about. If we think about it in, in that way, about reaching the parts, reaching the people that the mainstream services don't reach. But uh, I think everybody 
can take pride in what they're doing here, although it's early days, but this looks as though it's going to be a major uh, thing for, for Reading as, as a corporate um, enterprise. Thank you, John. And I think, Helen, did you want to speak? Hi, yeah, I just wanted to echo some of the sentiments really already expressed. It's been really great working with all of, of those um, present today on, on this project. Um, I think excellent progress has been made. Um, I think you were right to go with the soft launch to try and get things right, to test things out. Um, but, you know, confident we'll see the numbers going up as, as we move forward. I think it's really powerful to hear the actual stories of some of the people that, that you're seeing. Um, and it emphasises the importance of really focusing on those groups who wouldn't access services otherwise um, in, in the ways that they're offered in other, in other venues, um, which is really important and absolutely at the core of, of the project. So I just look forward to continuing to work with you. I think it's important that we, we keep an eye on how things are going, that we tweak things if need be. We do need to demonstrate the value and the benefit that the project is having, having linking into that ongoing discussion about ongoing sustainability. Um, but um, but yeah, ju just, just really helpful to hear how things are going and, and, and thank you for the information you shared today. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, I I just, I don't know if there's any other speakers. Oh, I can't see anybody. Um, yeah, I really welcome this report. It's, um, it's like others have said, it's incredibly rewarding to hear the work. And, you know, there's sort of things to me, I hear just a lot of talk about the collaboration, which is so important. And I think, as Tricia mentioned, it's so important, the trust that is obviously, um, you know, you're sort of gaining from the the community and people that really need the services so it's so important such vital work i was going to ask sort of all of you but as a group you know the barriers and this has been touched on already obviously but how what do you feel if you had to sort of summarize the, the barriers and a lot of you you have kind of touched on this but the barriers to achieving sort of the the projects i guess the key barriers are some of the people that we see that come back time and time again take time and if we're trying to get 5,200 um, checks and they still need us, you know, and it's trying to work out how do we change what we're doing slightly to be able to still manage those people that still won't go and necessarily do what they need to do, um, but will come back to us for their way in, their blood pressure, their whatever. Um, and as I said, they're a very complex bunch and you can spend, you know, you can sit there for an hour with a client because they are com complex. There's a lot of trauma informed stuff that's out there that we're dealing with. And that will just that will impact on those numbers. Um, and that's why we're trying to look how we can just change the profile slightly to make sure we still support those, but we still crack through the numbers. Can I just add there that? I see this three sessions a week at the moment in Whitley. We've got one tomorrow morning, actually. So if anybody wants a health check, <laughs> South Reading Hub between 9 and 12. And you can get some fruit and veg from our intervention project at the same time. So, you know, it's all round winners. Um, but I think that Sharon's right, it's that building trust. And it's back to that whole bit that we can sit really comfortably in our lives with people we talk to, with trusted friends or family, with somebody to talk to, with somebody that will listen, not have to listen to, oh, what are you moaning about again? And that kind of thing. Somebody that cares about us as a human being. And an awful lot of people I see every day don't actually have anybody that cares very much about them. And so they don't care about themselves either. And they really need that reassurance. And I, I don't care where a plea for it, but we need to keep that support happening because these are the people that we fish out of the river. These are the people that are living lives that none of us would want to live in this one shot thing. It's not a very nice shot some of them get. So I think we have to find a way to do something else. I won't, don't know where that will come from, but we can't let this stand in isolation because we've seen some really, really big positives now that I'd be terrified of the consequences if we took it away. Thank you, Trisha. Rachel? Yeah, I was, I was just going to add on the partnership working, not that that's um, one of the challenges, but um, I think it's the first time that we've actually had an opportunity to really get into the practicalities 
of the of the actual cold face of where the systems work together and to have the safe space to work it through it's not always been easy there's been <laughs> frustrations and all sides because everybody is genuinely wants to see it work and they're coming from you know through. but we have got the opportunity to actually talk work those through those challenges together which has been which has been really helpful really good to hear and again I, I really welcome the report and the you know the update and it's wonderful work I've also seen the fruit and veg market and it's wonderful everybody should pop down on a Saturday and see the brilliant work that goes on but every day but yeah so thank you very much for coming all of you and uh, you know hopefully you'll come back again so yeah thank you very much so if we move on now to agenda item six which is Western Berkshire Safeguarding Adults, um, Adults Board Annual Report 2022-2023. And we have Professor Keith Brown, who's the independent chair, introducing the report. back on again now yep. thank you it, it was flashing for some reason then it stopped and maybe i didn't hit it hard enough um 60 percent of the inquiries uh to do with um concerns about safeguarding were to do with in people's homes uh there's a drop in the number of in inquiries coming from hospitals we'll be pleased to hear uh, and a slight increase in the inquiries coming from care homes one of the things we're still struggling with though is um a poor understanding and the lack of implementation of the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, this remains a national issue. It's not just here. I think I'd want to say that in my experience, and it's certainly the case here in Reading, as a council, the staff are very good and have been well trained through training and support initiatives to understand the, the Mental Capacity Act. But uh, it's not so well understood uh, in the healthcare sector or in the private sector. And we are talking here about really quite fundamental things here. Uh, how can somebody give informed consent if they don't actually have the proper capacity to actually understand the issues? Indeed, I sometimes wonder whether any of us ever give proper informed consent when we go and it's a complex medical procedure. We're quite willing sometimes to sign and to say yes, aren't we? Uh, even if we don't fully understand and we're not properly informed. Um, I've got so concerned about this that I have actually decided I'm, I'm visiting all the local universities that provide health professional and social work professional education uh, and asking them as the chair of the board to uh, that I want to be assured that mental capacity is actually taught and assessed. Uh, the Mental Capacity Act is now well over a decade old and yet it's the major theme that comes out time after time in the safeguarding adult reviews. Uh, and so it's not something from a few years ago, it's from a decade ago. And I don't think it should be for you as a council or for hospitals to be spending most of your lives doing CPD development for, for professionally trained staff that have spent a number of years at university and still seem to be a little bit blindsided by this really fundamental piece of legislation. Um, I've also just recently been involved in the national SARS uh, analysis from 2019 to 2023 uh, and out of interest 62% uh, of all the SARS in the country have a theme of self-neglect in them uh, and that's something that's pretty paralleled here uh, in, in this area. I think self-neglect is a term I almost want to change uh, for these reasons. Um, when my mother was in her early stages of dementia with her cognitive decline, uh, she would and did uh, pick out something like a, a uh, thank you. Um, it keeps flashing and then going off. Uh, she, she could look at the packet of ham and she could read the sell by date 
but she didn't cognitively understand what the sell by date meant. So the question then is, if she eats the ham and gets food poisoning, was that self-neglect? No, that's cognitive impairment. So I think when we look at hoarding and we look at a lot of things and we automatically say self-neglect, the person needs to be changed. Often there's a mental capacity issue or a lack of understanding of capacity that needs to be understood. And so it's one of my nervousnesses about the term even uh, self-neglect. Um, I also want to make comment about the, uh, the role of advocacy work here in Reading and the voluntary sector. It really is very good. Uh, I chair the, uh, the voluntary sector advocacy group and we get a really rich um, uh, set of feedback from those people. I encourage you as a council to do all you can to fund advocacy. I think in the area of learning difficulties in particular, most of the scandals and things that have gone wrong nationally, it's where there hasn't been somebody to speak up on behalf of the person. But I don't want to say it's not a problem here. I'm actually saying the opposite. I want to commend you on that. I also want to thank the council and the other two councils and the members of the board. I think I must be one of the luckiest chairs of a board at the moment, safeguarding board this is. Although we historically have been very poorly funded, especially as we're a tribe borough, uh, we've actually had a significant increase the budget agreed to fund another staff worker. Um, I think we've been extremely good at managing our SARS here. The process has been excellent. The SAR reports have been very good. I just think we haven't always had the ability to ensure that the lessons learned from the SARS have been implemented in practice, or I can be assured that they've been implemented in practice. And this new worker will be uh, set aside with part of a task to look at the quality assurance and the implementation of learning from SARS. So I do genuinely want to thank this council and the other councils and the health authority, because in the current economic climate, uh, to find £40,000 more for my board is, uh, I know it's nigh on miraculous, so thank you. Uh, two further points. Um, one of the things that we do want to improve is our, is our links with other boards. Uh, I'm here today, I want to keep coming to these boards, but I think also the community safety partnerships. Um, I think I mentioned here last year, uh, we're only beginning to understand the full impact of fraud and scams, and even then we're not really fully understanding it because it's so underreported. And we've also got a, a much better understanding now of domestic violence and coercive control. And I think therefore the, ro the role of safeguarding boards must be to integrate and to work more closely with community safety partnerships in, in the coming months and years. Um, what was that comment? I can't even read my writing now. So it can't be that important. But if when oh yes, my final I do know. Um uh, you do have as a council um some waiting lists for safeguarding inquiries and dolls. Everybody does in the country. I don't blame you for that. I just want to encourage you to carry on trying to do something about them. You do have plans in action. I commend your plans in action. I can assure you, having just been interviewed by the CQC inspectors for West of Berkshire, and they were one of the first four councils, and I had my hour interview with inspectors, they were drilling down all over those areas. So you have got plans in action, just maintain them with my advice, and you'll do well in the CQC inspection, I'm sure. Any questions, comments or thoughts? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming. A very detailed um, report. So thank you very much. Before I sort of open up to colleagues, I was just going to ask if there are um, particular safeguarding concerns for Reading. Well, absolutely not. No, I genuinely, if there was, if I felt concerned about anything, I, I would raise them here. And the fact I'm telling you there aren't any, I, I genuinely, that I do not have significant concerns. Thank you. Um, and Councillor Gittings to speak. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, no, so, well, so we've got the, got the microphones sorted out, hopefully. Um, yeah, no, I was just really wanted to thank Keith and for, you know for his work. I mean, he did give me a briefing on this a, a couple of months ago, and this work is in, in, incredibly valued, 
valuable. And I think, to be honest with you, is probably slightly under under resourced. But it's good to see that we have found the money to um, to, to 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 give that bit of extra resource. It's good also to be a to be a first actually the tripartite. Although for Reading, that's always what we want. But we're having to share it at Woking and West Barks. But you know, hey, you know, we can be generous. So it's it's an, it, you know it's a wide area you, you, you're covering. But um, I, I am sort of hopefully assured, and also thank you also for the advice as regards the CQC in, in inspection because I think you know safeguarding inquiries obviously remain quite high, and we I think there are backlogs. And I'm glad to see, you know, we're doing it in Reading, we're trying our best to make sure that those backlogs remain uh, a, 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 as small as possible. I was also struck by your some your part of your report. It says many parts of the health and social care sector continue to have a very high and unsustainable vacancy rates, which puts additional pressure on the staff within the system. I mean, I think that's putting it mildly, to be quite honest. And at the budget meeting, I did speak about obviously the pressures on adult social care in the in the wider wider picture, and that does obviously go into these areas. You know, it said you said society as a whole does need to stand back and review how it values and appreciates staff working in this sector, particularly in the adult and domiciliary care sector. We'll hear here to that. Um, I, but my sort of kind of question at the end of that was, it was good to see that domestic abuse figures um, had 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 reduced, and obviously, sort of post COVID, I suppose you might expect that in terms of the way obviously people are existing within within their home environment, but there were there was a, a big increase in what we call organisational abuse, um, which I, I was trying to work out what what actually that might mean in terms of that, and also modern slavery. I mean, it's only five inquiries, but it's something that we I know has been raised by councillors, you know, as, as as an existing problem. So, I just wonder if you wanted to touch on those areas, Keith. And so, but again, thanks for the work that you've done. And they are some of them. They are they are quite linked, actually. Um, we live in an area, you live in an area with quite high costs of living and therefore to try and persuade people to do what can often frankly be quite complex domiciliary type care work at minimum wage plus a few pennies is not easy. One of my concerns therefore does link to the modern slavery bit. We do have a nationally some examples of people uh, bringing people in on illegal uh, immigration um, uh, work permits. And then we've got some gangs with people. We certainly had one in uh, the North West, uh, North Wales in the North West, where they were bringing people in, getting them to work for them and making them work 100 hour week, 40 hour weeks on minimum wage, 60 hour weeks on nothing, holding the passports back and doing a gang labor type thing. I've actually written to the gang master licensing authority. That was something that was created when the um, cockle shell people died in Morecambe Bay. Uh, the government set up the gang master licensing authority to license uh, shell picking, uh, fruit and veg picking, abattoir work and fl uh, flowers, picking flowers. Uh, and I was suggesting that um, we really need to put social care into that category. Uh, and I was pretty heavily pushed back along the lines of this is all recorded, isn't it? I've got to be careful what I say now. Not much chance of much happening until the election's over type thing. So um, I, I, it does worry me. And, and I'm, I'm trying to hint that and make the comments in these scenarios. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting in any shape or form that I've got categorical evidence as a major problem just outside this building. But we'd be naive to believe there's not the opportunity for people to seek advantage in these areas where it's hard to find people to work, hard to find people to work in care homes and domiciliary care. These are areas that we, as people that oversee these things, have to look out and to consider. And in a sense, that's what we're meaning by some of this manage management and organisational situations that are much more complex and difficult than they were. Thank you, Keith. And John is on Teams. Yeah, thanks, um, Keith. That was a very nice focused um, the report. Uh, just a couple of points, really. I've put a, a reference in the sidebar there of um, a, a recent publication, which I've been involved with, with architects and engineers uh, designed for dementia. Mm -hmm. Because um, what we're 
when you referred to it really when you're talking about self neglect is that what's needed often is environmental adjustment and env environmental design to make it safer for people to to be able to live independently still with with um, dementia so you know that's a, an important area um on the violence uh, side i mean um the world health organization categorizes violence um to include violence against children intimate partner violence which includes domestic violence, one-on-one -on -one adult male violence, whether that's, um, and also gang violence and terrorism and so on. But the violence against older people can take various forms. And the thing about it is that it's under-researched and poorly understood and apparently rapidly growing. Uh, and, you know, this may be um, problematic um, relationships because of frailty and um, dementia or it may be much more cynical than that about relatives wanting to get access to property and uh, assets of, of of older people and so on and this is an area which um, we, we really need to throw a lot more uh, light on. Um, on the um, informed... Do you want me to respond well, to just what you said? I'll just be very quick with this okay. last point um, on informed consent. It looks as though there's likely to be movement on um, assisted dying um, in the new parliament. And so clearly informed consent is going to become a very important issue. So that's all I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. so we, we spent a lot of years trying to understand capacity. And it's been a bit too binary. So do you have capacity or do you not have capacity? And actually, the law is much more subtle than that. It, mean, it talks about decision specific capacity, i.e. do you have the capacity to make that decision? And that's what people forget. And so we're now increasingly talking about executive functioning. What I mean by that is you could, you could have, my late mother, you could have spoken to my mother you could have brought her here and because she was quite a glamorous and high profile person, you'd have thought, wow, isn't she capable and able? If you spoke to her for a bit longer, you start to realise half the time she didn't know what clue she was talking about. Yeah, executive functioning is really quite nuanced and we're only just beginning as health and social care professionals to get our grip and an understanding around this. And the example I gave about the packet of ham is that maybe a bit trite and a bit silly. But actually, you ramp that up into bigger pictures and it becomes extremely important. And you're right. It's the way we design buildings and the way we design architecture and all sorts of things to reduce that confusion, to allow people to cognitively cope more effectively. If just your final comments about end of life care and dignity, dignity and death and these sorts of things. Um, I, I have some personal concerns about changes to the legislation about assisted dying unless we fully as society understand cognitive impairment and cognition to make those decisions because how do we stop people being persuaded to end their life we can all imagine the scenario could we not where people are saying come on mum you've had a good life take the tablet, then you don't have to go in a care home, then we can inherit the house. And it worries me that I might be here in 10 or 15 years time talking about a whole new load of financial abuse based on end of life care. Does that make sense? So the safeguards we have to build in in these scenarios are quite significant. And it's taken us over 10 years to even begin to understand that capacity is not binary, yes or no. So I just think there's a lot of walk, a lot of travel to be taken by us all in these areas that are poorly understood, poorly researched. And, and one of the things, as, as Councillor Gittings talked, we look for data, we look for numbers. And in areas where people don't come forth, we don't know what's going on. Does that make sense? It's the unknown unknowns and the known knowns and all these sorts of the on Roosevelt type thing. And with older, lonely people with dementia, they often don't come forward and they're not in our stats. Sorry, I'm beginning about a lecture now, aren't I? Spot the old yeah. professor.
No, it's actually very interesting. Thank you. Um, and Lisa wanted to raise a point. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I really wanted to publicly thank Keith for all of his work with the board. Um, you know, yes, we are the only Triborough um, board, um, but that takes some very careful and sophisticated navigation on Keith's part. And I'm really grateful for his experience and passion that he brings. Um, I think Keith uh, um, raised the point about funding and, you know, to be really clear, that was driven by you, Keith. So, yes, the partners found the money because it was absolutely the right thing to do. But you were able to evidence and be really clear about the outcomes that, that could be delivered. Um, as the director of adult social care, I felt it really appropriate to um, come back on Keith's point about um, what we're doing around waiting times. And naturally, I can assure you about the work and continued focus um, on that. Um, and I'll absolutely stand beside you on ensuring that we continue to learn um, as a partnership on those safe, the outcomes of safeguarding adults reviews, um, because that is fundamental, really. You know, uh, the benefit of the reviews is for us to learn and reflect. And the key is to making sure that's embedded in practice. Um, and then my final point really was your point, Keith, around connections with the boards and the community safety partnerships, the two that you referenced. Um, you know, having you once a year at the Health and Wellbeing Board is fantastic to reflect on the work that's done. Um, but we all know and recognise and we've got into a bit of it today, the importance of safeguarding and some of the moral dilemmas and the complexities of the people that we're working with. So I naturally welcome any opportunities to bring safeguarding to the front um as really important thank you thank you melissa so anybody else that had any questions or comments for keith no i'd just like again to say um really thank you very much for coming along today and presenting the part it's a very always very useful and you know informative and so really good to see you again and Hopefully, see you. Next I week. will be back. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. So, um, moving on now to agenda item seven, which is the CAMS Learning Disability Team and Key Working Team Berkshire West update. And we have um, Sharon Brooks and Emma Mapes presenting, and they're online. Hi, I'm Hi. Emma Mapes. Hi, I'm so Sharon I Brooks. Oh, right, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so is it, I'll hand over to you then. Thank you. I'll share my screen so that you can see the presentation. Thanks, Emma. OK, can you all see that OK? Sharon, can you see that? Yeah, I can see. Everyone else see OK? Yes, thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you so much for coming to invite both myself and Emma along today um, to talk to you about the CAMS Learning Disability Team and the Key Working Team. Um, I'm Sharon Brooks. I'm a Service Manager at Berkshire Healthcare. Emma, I think we lost a slide. Got it. Yeah. Um, we're here, I've come to talk about the new CAMS Learning Disability Service. So I don't know if you're aware that this new service has started. Um, it became operational on January the 29th this year. Um, so it's a really exciting time ahead for us, lots of energy and passion and excitement about it. Um, and it's a chance to provide some specialist services and interventions for this group of children, young people and their families. Can I have the next slide, please, Emma? Yeah. Oh, hang on, I, that's it. Yeah, who we are. So we're, we're, as I said, we're a specialist learning disability team. Um, we're here to support children and young people who've been diagnosed or suspected LD cases, um, which are moderate to severe. So suspected being quite important in that terminology. Um, lots of children and young people don't have access to actually getting diagnosed with a full LD diagnosis so we have to look at suspected cases as well. Mild learning disability cases will go through mainstream services as would typically could typically be your children in mainstream schools accessing sort of mainstream services to help as well. Okay it's predominantly as well so children with learning disabilities um, with 
with mental health needs as well and require mental health support. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is our referral criteria. So we've broken it down into service inclusion and service exclusion. Um, we've had to think really carefully about the provision and criteria of this service. So this is a Berkshire wide service that's across the east and west of Berkshire. Um, given the size of the team and the coverage that we have to provide, um, as it's new, we're kind of expecting our work to be providing consultation to a lot of other teams and services. So some of the criteria are going to be quite hard to define without understanding the full picture. So there's sort of some wording in there where it, it we've got significant behaviours that challenge associated with a mental health need, but that was something that would need unpicking. What, how's that behaviour started? What Was there a mental health need associated with that? Is it a form of communication? There's going to be more and more questions. So I can see that a big proportion of our work will be consulting more fully initially with other services just to understand the fuller picture, to check that these children were right for this service, um, but also that we're meeting their needs properly. Um, so that's that's really important. Um, as you can see from this slide, it's for children aged 15 to 17. I've already talked about diagnosed moderate or severe learning disability. Um, registered with a GP, obviously in Berkshire. Experiencing significant emotional mental health need or significant behaviours that challenge associated with mental health needs. And then the service excluded, no surprise, it's kind of the opposite. But I think it's quite important to sort of draw out the part that we can't just see children who've got standalone diagnosis of autism or other neurodevelopmental disorders well without the evidence of a learning disability. Um, something that I think both the East and West Berkshire are thinking through what they want to do about that and what what the what the kind of needs are. Um, as I said before, a mild learning disability will go through mainstream CAMs. Okay, next slide, please. Referral process. So we accept referrals um, from all professionals and they come in the same way as our other CAM services. So we have an online referral form for Berkshire Healthcare, um, which the referrals can be made on the home page. The address is there. Um, when they come through, we'll triage the cases. They'll get triaged in the common point of entry, which is the main CAM sort of hub where all the referrals go and then they'll get sent over to us. Internally, we have a weekly referral meeting where the cases be triaged and screened. And at that time, we'll get in touch with the referrer and young person and family with the outcomes of the discussions. And I said that the consultation and further information is going to be quite a large part of this work, I think. So sometimes we'll be coming back for more information so that we can understand the young person's needs more fully. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Emma. So recruitment to date. So we're quite a small team, but as I say, very exciting, very significant that we've got this service. Um, we've got a full time clinical um, psychologist who's also the team lead, who she's got extensive learning disability experience. So she's really brilliant. Um, a full time psychiatrist who's currently a locum. We have a learning disability nurse and another post um, as well so there's there's sort of two posts but one of the posts also leads on professional nurse lead for um, children young people in CAMS as well. We've got um, another clinical psychologist post which is going back out to advert at the moment I've just shortlisted so we're hopeful we're going to get someone this time round. We've got a behavioural specialist who she's brilliant she's great pieces of work for us so far obviously admin um, assistant psychologist and we're going to recruit another assistant psychologist hopefully going forward. Um, so that's that's the team. So they're quite it's quite a small team to think about the size of East and West Berkshire because it adds up sort of six, seven whole time equivalents. But again, it's great to have some form of provision rather than no provision. Next slide, please. Okay, progress to date. So as I said, we became operational 29th of January. I've actually it says as of the 14th of February for the February figures. That was the whole of February. Um, so what we did before January the 29th, we kind of did a soft launch and took some test cases just to sort of work out our, our process, our processes and working with external partners about what's working, what's not working, um, to look at our own referral processes internally, checking our systems are working, etc. So there's some cases taken on November, December um, and the beginning of January, but then we became operational. Um, so that data is current for the, until the end of February. We're obviously in March now, and I know that that figure now is 71 cases been referred and not 62. Um, so it's quite a high 
demand and need, but I think we'd sort of expected that. OK, next slide, please, Emma. So this pie chart shows us so far where the referrals have been coming from. Um, so the biggest sort of chunks of the pie is some internal CAMS cases. So we had some cases traditionally that were there that needed the specialist service. Um, education, so from the special schools, quite predominantly, um, GP practices and community-based peds are the, the biggest areas. And then smaller areas, so social care themselves, um, carers and relatives. I've looked at that self-referral 8% and that that is a recording issue. So that is care and relatives. So that should be 10% with both of them put in together. Um, but quite interesting to see how it's broken down so far. So it's very early days, but it's good to get some early data to have a look to see what's happening. Next slide, please. OK, so progress to date. So this, as I say, the service up and running, we're starting to see our first um, children and families and providing interventions. Very exciting um, <coughs> in terms of sort of where the service is going. We've created this ongoing um, struggles nationally to recruit permanent psychiatrists, I think particularly in the CAMS LD world as well. So as a service, we've created a promotional video um, with some of our psychiatrists on it, which go out on all links um, for adverts psychiatrists now. So it kind of tells the story of working in Berkshire healthcare and how much they enjoy it, to try and make it a bit more of a personal touch. Um, we've been working with the special schools in the borough, so both over in the west and the east. So we've met with all the special school heads um, to ensure we've got consultation offer in place. The school's obviously very keen for this service. It's been really positive. Um, we've run a number of webinars for professionals. We've run two so far um, and we've been over books, so we're providing a third one. And we're going to think about sort of ongoing training webinar offers going forward. Um, and then we're working both with East and West ICBs for those children that receive spot purchasing packages. So there was a number of children um, that whilst this service being created, um, it got spot purchasing pre predominantly for um, behavioural support interventions. So we're working with PBS UK um, currently just to see which children be appropriate to be coming back to us, which children have had their offer and could go somewhere else. Um, so that's a good piece of work going on. And just to sort of say there's been a steering group, obviously, in the background behind all of this work that's been running now. I'm trying to think how long it's been running for Emma, but it started off key working, didn't it? And then it we did, kind of yeah. joined you maybe a year, I think. So both East and West um, people were there. So we've got a whole range of stakeholders invited to that meeting to get the whole breadth of each each area. Um, it's still continuing to run for the CAMS Any Disability Service at the moment, because at the moment we want to look at kind of outcome measures, measures of success, what changes have we seen? So it feels quite important that that still continues at this point in time. Next slide, please. You're over to me now, Sharon. Oh, OK. Over <laughs> to you, Emma. Thanks. OK, so nice to meet you all. I'm Emma Mapes. I am the team lead for the key working team in Berkshire West. So we've been commissioned to also hold the dynamic support register as well for um, the Berkshire West footprint. Um, it's to actually, for those of you that aren't aware, but to refer to our service, a, anyone between the ages of 0 to 25 who have a diagnosis of autism and or learning disability that are at risk of psychiatric inpatient admission can be referred to our service. So as long as they're RAG rated as red or amber, which is immediate or imminent risk of admission, then we can get involved. And our main role is to actually make sure that we unblock all those barriers and try and support to get the family's needs met and help them navigate all the systems, which is health, social care, education and the voluntary sector. So within my team, I do have dynamic support navigators and community link workers. And my community link workers will help those young people to actually link in with resources like Autism Berkshire <coughs> to groups that are running and things like that to actually really embed them into the community so they can live a full and thriving lifestyle. So this is some of the data. Now we went um, live, we again, we did a soft launch that was back in January 
2023, we did a soft launch. Um, so at that time, we weren't really collecting any data or anything else. So we started to collect all of our data around November 2023 when we felt we were much more established. And we've done a lot of work with young people's forums, parent and carer forums, schools and things like that to kind of get our name out there. So since November 2023 to the end of January this year, this is kind of the number of inquiries that we've had. Over the last um, year, we're actually, I think, including adults, we've, we've just tipped over to 100 inquiries at the moment. So we are doing quite well with this. So this, what you can see, we had two self-referrals because we do take self-referrals. That's also, there's a link on our web page on the BHFT website, and that links straight into a referral form. People can just contact us and have a conversation. So we get at the moment a lot of internal. So we're doing a lot of work to make sure that our external colleagues, the um, social care, education and families themselves know about us and know how to refer. And we can just have that conversation around do they meet our remit? And if not, where can we kind of recommend that they might want to approach next? So you can see, sadly, at the moment in January, we haven't had any referral or inquiries really from external or self. So we know that we continue to need to do some work on that. So this is really about how we've divided up where we've got the data on, where these inquiries are coming from. So as you can see, Reading, we've had a much higher number of inquiries coming in. And then West Berkshire is a lot lower. We we did actually think that might come up a little bit, but it hasn't at the moment. Wokingham is the next highest with five. And then we have East Berkshire is, um, we have put that on, even though we don't cover East Berkshire, and that is covered by Bernardo's, um, Frimley ICB have gone with the voluntary sector to commission it. We still get inquiries for them. So we link in a lot with the East Key working team and we will give people contact details. But we still log if we get that inquiry and we just make sure that they get to the right door, really. So and we haven't had any out of area because we work. We work really closely nationally. We use the Futures NHS platform for people to make sure they've got the right contact details for different key working teams around England to make sure that we can link in and we know who we need to contact if someone is transitioning to a different area. So presently on um, up to the end of January for our dynamic support register, our RAG ratings were as follows. So we did have seven that were blue. <coughs> so blue means that they are an inpatient. So this goes up to the age of 25 as well. So we had three young people and then the other four were adults that were in inpatients as well. So thankfully, that is now down to three. I can give you that up to date information because I had a look at that just a minute ago. So we've only really got um, three young people that are in inpatient, but we do have one adult that is just about to move out of um, inpatient. We have three that are at risk of immediate admission to psychiatric inpatient. So we're working really closely with those networks to try and reduce that. And we've got 12 around amber, which is maybe imminent or we might be moving them, slowly moving them round to green. Green is that there's a, a lot less risk of inpatient admission. And actually, the networks are really working well together. So you can see we've got 10 and those 10 of we've moved them from either blue, red or amber and they're going out of the service now. So it's what we always feel that the trend will be that we will always have a higher number in amber. And that's kind of where we really need to sort of like to move them then down to that green. So this is our percentage of referrals up till the end of January. So we had 25 percent that we accepted. And then we have 55 percent. Now, that looks really high that we've declined. But what we have done with those is we've done consultation. So we've spoken to the referrer. We've spoken to the family. We've spoken to all of those that are involved with that person. And we've really done a bit of a deep dive to make sure that actually are they kind of 
are they at risk? Do they require us? And if they don't, we'll then put in recommendations for the network and for the family as to where they might want to go next and what they might want to consider implementing for this family. So we may have made suggestions to um, social care that they might want to think about. Have they considered making a request for a purchase of PBS because that's not provided anywhere else? So I know that um, Sharon's team is looking at some PBS, but however, it might not be available <coughs> for those that just have autism. So it's about really thinking about those recommendations. It might be that they need their EHCP reviewed and things like that to support with that. And it might be that that's down to a placement breakdown or that their school is struggling at the moment and might not be suitable for them. So we work really closely with those networks just to make sure, even though we don't accept it, we are making those recommendations. So we've still got 15% that are, we're still in that consultation phase. So we're doing all that deep dive, we're getting all that information out. And then we've got 5% that we've had inquiries for, we've sent out our referral pack, and we're just waiting for those referrals to come in. So we just keep and like to keep an eye on that and what's happening to these young people. So these are the age ranges around and some EHCP data. So we haven't got any on our DSR that are up to the age of five. We have one young person who is female between the age of six and 11 that is currently on our DSR. And we've got between the age of 12 to 17, we have 15, which, which is the inquiries, eight of which um, were female, seven were male. And between the age of 18 to 25, we had four. And then we've got one is female, three were male. And we are finding that with the adults, we're tending to get at the moment a few more males than we are females. But that may change as we move along. So with the EHCPs, we've got 21 on our 0 to 25 DSR that do have an EHCP in place. We've got three that do not have any EHCP in place. We've got four that they are in progress and we've got 14 that there's their gathering of information for that EHCP. And then we had 11 that weren't applicable. So and when we say that they're not applicable, um, that means that those that don't meet the remit for that key working team. So they, they aren't RAG rated red or amber or an inpatient, which is RAG rated blue. So that's what we mean by not applicable for that one. This is a sample of some of the feedback that we've um, had over the past year. We, I would say we've been really lucky and I will blow the team's trumpet on this. Most months we do get quite a few compliments from people um, and they come from a real variety of people. So um, you can see there we've had a tier four consultant. I won't read them all out. I'm sure you can all read those. Um, just saying thank you because we were highlighting and making sure that that young person was on a section three of the Mental Health Act. And we needed to make sure that all the section 117 commissioners were involved in those discussions around their discharge to make sure they got those aftercare rights in place. So that was really nice to have that kind of feedback. We get quite a lot from parents and from young people themselves just to say that most of most common one we get is um, that I don't have on there, but is that they say, we're really pleased you did what you said you were going to do. You phoned me when you said you were going to do it. You did what you said you were going to do. And that's really helpful. And sometimes it's just, you know, just being able to listen and have that time because we are independent. Although we sit under health, we are independent of CAMS and we need to be so that we can work across health, social care, education and the voluntary sector. And that, I think, is able for then parents and young people to feel that they can have those open and honest conversations with us. So it just gives them another different angle. And also we work really closely with our safeguarding colleagues as well. So within social care and also with BHFT safeguarding um, named lead nurses as well. So they're involved in and we have monthly safeguarding supervision with those leads just to make sure that we're talking about the holistic picture of this family and we're considering everything. So which has been really positive. So. 
continued service development that we've got at the moment. So we are developing, continuing to develop the adult side of it, which is the 18 to 25. So this month, we have gone live with accepting adults from the community. When we first started accepting adults back at the end of last year, we were just taking on inpatients because I needed to do a bit of scoping about how many people were we expecting to come in because we are only a small team. I have four dynamic support navigators and one, um, one and a half community link workers. So we are a really small team to be doing this work. So we now have gone completely live. We are fully operational with 0 to 25. So we take community and inpatient for both young people and for adults, which I'm really pleased about. So we did some recruitment of the ongoing fixed term positions. We now I'm actually at a point one of my workers has handed their notice in because they've um, emigrated to Canada, which is very lovely. So but so I'm just recruiting for that post at the moment. Um, and I'll need to recruit again for another community link worker so that other will come out live soon as well. And we've also we're trying to set up a review panel. So this is something that the um, CQC are really keen on. Um, and we want it to be the dynamic support register to be really dynamic. So it's not just a spreadsheet. It's not something that just tells you a lot of information about these vulnerable young people across what Berkshire West it actually is useful. So what we mean by a review panel is that I'm trying to pull together representatives from social care and from education and from the health, our CAMS colleagues and maybe CMHT as well. So and an ICB representative. So we can talk about these young people that are on the dynamic support register and look at where are our barriers, what are the trends and how we can escalate when there are gaps and things like that. So we really think about these young people and actually how can we move them forward so they get these needs met, which then reduces the need for psychiatric inpatient. So. We're also continuing to grow our self-referrals. So at the moment, I'm looking at trying to produce some business cards that we can potentially have in A&E, in school receptions, maybe GP practices, that people can then just scan the QR code that's on the business card, and that will take them straight to the BHFT webpage where they can find information about us and straight link to our referral form as well and our contact details so it makes it much easier for them to be able to have that conversation with us. We're also producing a DSR parent and carer forum to help promote co-production around the service so we're hoping to go live with that on the 18th of April um, this year so we're just going to get our flyer out so we've done a lot of talking to our parents that use our service and we just want them to be able to kind of talk about what do they feel they need from this service as well. And we also want them to help develop the young persons forum as well for those that are on the dynamic support register. Because when we, we find that we go to other parent and carer forums and young people's forums, but they haven't had the same experiences. So we want to hear from those that have been through systems have also maybe had a psychiatric inpatient admission or are on the cusp of that and what's their experiences and what can we do to help change things for them. So that's really important for us. I'm also very closely linked in with the Send Local Offer. So any changes to our service, I will make sure that our web page is updated and that the Send Local Offer are made aware of that. And also they will send me things as well, which I can then circulate to the team, which they can send out to our young people and families that are actually using on the DSR. So I'm still going out to do presentations to everyone. And for me, that is always going to be a continued thing because we need to make sure that we are still out there being promoted and people know what we do. And also to make sure that all the agencies we work with understand what our service does. So we hear a lot that we will coordinate services. We don't coordinate, what we do is navigate. So we're supporting families to navigate systems and speak up for those families. So also we link a lot with commissioning. So I'm part of a steering group to streamline community education treatment reviews. 
for those people that are at risk of psychiatric education. So we're trying to make that system a lot better. So I link in with that group as well. So I'm part of the work that goes on with that. And also it is continuing to identify gaps and trends within Berkshire West so that we can continue to highlight that to senior managers and the Bob ICB to think about where they might want to commission services. It's not to say that they will if I tell them these things, but at least I'm highlighting it to them. So our challenges so far have been that I've had some long term sickness within the team which has been a bit of a challenge and it has delayed our progressing the adult work. But thankfully, we're in a much better position now and we are actually fully operational, like I said, with the adult work now. So it is about the promotion now with the adult services and to get those relationships built with them. So also to continue to ensure, like I said, the agencies understand our role and that we get some appropriate referrals. And also, to make sure I get my review panel in place. So we really are having those multi-agency discussions for those that are on the dynamic support register. And that's all from us. So is there any questions? I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much for that um, in-depth report. Really interesting to hear about the work and the incredibly important work that, um, you know, obviously uh, the service that commenced in January. Um, I can see that um, John has a hand raised. So. Well, thank you. I thought that was a very impressive um, report and thank you very much because this is a group that um, doesn't get the attention it needs and deserves. Um, I've got a couple of things really. Uh, firstly, about your hope for recruiting a permanent um, consultant. Um, I, I wouldn't be that optimistic. I mean, my experience of this, when I was regional medical officer in the Northwest, we were carrying, um, I think, more than 20 vacancies for consultant, um, consultants in learning disability. Mm -hmm. Um, medical students and graduates don't want to do this um, unless it's changed since I was involved with it. And I think, you know, m most of the care and issues about these groups isn't clinical, but there there is a bit of clinical, which is important. And so the the question really is, how do you get that clinical input, and are there other ways of doing it? Um, are there ways of having a general practitioner who's got a special interest or a nurse specialist or are there other ways of coming at this or growing that clinical input in a different way? What I found was that the psychiatric establishment in the Northwest was sitting on all these posts but wouldn't relinquish them to be used by other professionals like psychologists or other people that might have another professional background that could have been a valuable addition to the team. So it was a really kind of dog in a manger situation, which wasn't at all helpful. So, um, you know, and, and my experience is that as well, where you do find a clinician who champions the cause of this, it's often for family reasons that maybe they've got a child themselves or another member of the family has a child um, with learning disabilities and so they have a passion for this area. But, um, you know, certainly I'd encourage you to think laterally about how you go about that if you are unable to recruit. Um, mm. That's um, really helpful, John. We, um, interestingly, we've sort of been looking at a, a plan B, I suppose, in the background. So we've been thinking about nurse medical prescribers, about we've got some specialist pharmacists in the trust as well that can kind of advise and help oversee. So we, we're looking at different options at the moment. Um, and we've linked into there's a CAMS LD psychiatry network. So we've kind of linked in with them as well. Uh, they reviewed our job description and sort of said, it's great. You've got everything you need on it. So it, you're quite right. I think it is something we need to 
be well, really clear on and think about what do we need and I guess it's really hard because we just become operational but I think it will be something we like you say we need to be quite lateral about it I think so it's and, really and, helpful to hear and that don't, and don't lose too much time trying to go down one way before you go down another way you know I mean the other bit of that is that um, I mean I trained in psychiatry many many years ago and one of the things that looking back on that is that really our attention to physical health was not good. Um, and I think that psychiatrists often become de-skilled when it comes to physical medicine. Mm. And we know that, that the, 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 the outcomes, the medical outcomes for people with psychiatric or learning disability diagnoses are poor. So, you know, health checks is a good example, you know, of, of uh, what needs to happen, of monitoring and keeping mm -hmm. an eye on and ensuring that um, they don't, you know, have their mental health needs met, but then they come to grief physically. So it is needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the other thing I just wanted to mention as well is, um, I mean, you've obviously got a very comprehensive approach, but um, are you also picking up on pathways into work? Because I know, you know, 90% of young adults with learning disabilities are not in employment. Um, and this is something, I mean, I'm involved with Strawberry Field in Liverpool, you know, which is where John Lennon got his inspiration. And um, that's now a, a centre for training young adults with learning disabilities. Uh, and it's linked into employers in Liverpool and Merseyside. And they've got, I think they're up to about their 15th cohort now. They get they get experience in the, the the experience about the song and the story of the song, the cafeteria and the shop and all the rest of it, and they're just feeding them through a pipeline into employment. Um, so you know, there's something about that being more positive about what might be mm. possible, mm. really. Mm. Yeah, anyway, I, thank, I, th thank you. Yeah. No, that's really really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we've got a couple of questions online. And the first is, um, I think it's Alice. Can Jeffrey Clifton first? Oh, no, sorry. Then. <laughs> would, you, would, would you want the other Alice to go first? Yeah, if you go first, Alice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Emma. The, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, you know, you, your service, how are you... Um, highlighting it to the public, how are you communicating to the public, especially those with who are seldom heard? What are you doing? It'd be nice to hear because um, it sometimes it appears that, you know, you have the um, lower fruit scenario and, and, and the, especially the seldom heard are the ones who struggle the most. So it'd be quite good to hear from you. How are you going to do this? Because you know, I think that's very important, especially this, mm. this taboo when you look at CAMS and learning disability among yeah. those seldom heard. Yeah, I completely agree, Alice. I think, I think you know, part of the strategy of the, the steering group for the East and West has been, whilst we've been setting up, key, key people, are, we've got the parent user forums on there, and we've got carer reps on there. Um, we really need to think about, so it's, it's very early days for the CAMS LD service, but what we really need to think about and what, what that steering group is absolutely committed to is the whole service user sort of getting the voice, getting feedback, um, and thinking about how we're going to do that. So we were talking through about what our um, sort of measures of success are going to look like and that, that there needs to be something about service users in there. And what does that look like? How do we make that meaningful? How do we collect that? So at the moment, we're setting up like a separate steering group, well, not steering group, separate project group to have a look at those those items just to think through how are we going to do that who do we need to link it because that that's you're right it's key it's got to be a big part of this service and I really want the service user voice to come through and help shape it as well so yeah any help if there's anything you can help us with it'd be amazing <laughs> I mean the whole uh, we do reach out to the communities as such but it's yeah. just the fact that one of the things that I find is the language that we use we have to be make sure making sure that it's culturally appropriate as well so you know and not to make so medicalized that you will not get people 
to interact. And that is the most important thing. Um, and uh, But I also find that sometimes the steering groups are very dim um, what one dimension. And it, you know, you have to really reach out to the diverse communities as well. Mm. And it's got to be yeah. all inclusive. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I might Thanks. get your Sorry. details and be helpful to have a think outside if that's all right, Alice. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Um, do we have any other speakers or questions? Um, Alice, Councillor Mahufu Coles. Hi there, Alice. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, uh, thanks very much for your detailed uh, report uh, that uh, really uh, gave, gave me also some thoughts about uh, things that are probably happening even in wards like uh, a weekly ward, uh, where I am one of the places when you see the statistics, it normally mentions a lot of uh, problems when it comes to mental health and some of it starts from schools uh, getting into uh, adulthood and getting to filter into other spaces. I too had a few observations on this about um, spaces where young people should go uh, for mental health. Most of the time I think systematically it has been young people go to probably a, a place where it's called for, for assessment, a, a, Times or a prospect park or hospital or something like that. Have you ever thought about uh, decentralizing about things? Because the stigma in mental health is so much uh, difficult for young people to themselves take a step with their parents if they're under 18 to be seen walking into these spaces where it's actually labeled and done in a specific way, where you can decentralize in spaces where we have community centers with also other places like uh, uh, where you can have access to mental health, even the, um, the initial one where you can use a CPN to come in and talk to, to young people in communities themselves. Then for them, when they've identified that the parents then come to you when it's serious, uh, it becomes a breach and it becomes a problem in that so that it becomes a decentralized place, a space where they can easily be able to talk about uh, mental health. Because as we have seen also, as you know, the statistics are um, post-COVID, the comparison is very important. Again, that's another point to look at what has happened prior to COVID and what is happening now post-pandemic because now it's almost one to six young people are, are, are really struggling with mental health and they might they might have come to your services. Uh, um, it, it's not clear, but it is known that one in six children are struggling with mental health and most of it is seen in schools than it is seen in proper spaces for NHS and uh, Berkshire Healthy Care. So that's one of the other things that how we can also work within the schools and also uh, community areas of trying to bring in such uh, ideas in, in, in spaces where we know. Uh, also another point that I picked from here is that uh, uh, I think alluded to it about that uh, in, in another way, but is that uh, all these things are linked up, which affect the children, the young people, are af especially after this COVID and prior to that, as we know, there's been hostility and then there's coming to be the recession and all these things that affect their families. And when it it affects their families. It gives a lot of pressure to young people. Economically, they become more poorer, and they also it they make it makes them feel uh, affected by mental health, and then it impacts them. And then the things also feel they don't have. Can that be looked into holistic? I know you're busy, you struggle with staff, which is one of the main issues in that. But if there is ways that you can think about how community groups, voluntary uh, groups that are in Reading, and also the council and councillors can actually help in this and so that you don't feel like you're working in isolation without the links that are very mm -hmm. crucial for your strategy to work. Thank you.
No, it's really helpful, Alice. And I think we probably echo that sentiment. I think it's really important, isn't it? There's a, you know, there's a place to be seen at different points, isn't there, in your care and normalising and not stigmatising. So the, the, the CAMS LD service that we've set up, that certainly we envisage most of our visits will be home visits or special schools because that's where we need to be. But in terms of you're sort of talking about the school offer, aren't you, which and and kind of out in the community the sort of earlier help so we call that getting help so it'd be the getting help end of the level we have got people going into what's they're called mhs teams i don't know if you've heard of the mental health support teams that go into the schools it's a sort of starting point but we want to do a piece of work of actually looking at all the boroughs and linking in we sort of started that piece of work but i think they're big systems aren't they each place quite big systems to, to navigate really so we're doing linking in we're part of the early help hubs locally in in all of the local authorities helping look at those assessments and thinking about where those referrals go and how we do that but also as you say what's the offer out there and how do we link in with any of the community things so that's it's really important thank you thank you uh, councillor gittings yeah yeah thanks 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 for updating us on this uh work i mean you obviously didn't have quite a small team and i i can't help but feel that this is the kind of tip of the iceberg in terms of the people being referred to you because we know from pre obviously previous meetings of the health and well-being board i think at the last one the 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 backlog of referrals for cams with people with special educational needs was was vast and and, and, and unmet so that some of those people clearly will come into your service because it, it, it struck me that the, the the cutoff if you look was between the people who are excluded and the people who are included would seem to be a kind of fine line actually and I, I don't know if that's the, if that's the case because your numbers seem quite small but obviously people being re referred through cams and obviously special education needs a councillor uh, who, who Coles has referred to there's vast numbers in in, in schools so I don't I, I, I don't know whether that's the is that's the reality and then that eventually you're going to get much bigger numbers coming coming through I mean I do applaud the work you doing around co-production i think that's that sort of kind of make would make a sort of um a, a point about that is that i think the thing about co-production is that you are treating people on an equal basis so i would say that terms like service user do sort of set people aside as a special group other than and there's no sort of equity i understand why it's used but i think this is about treating families and and people who are having to access these services as equals, and then I think some of that work you're doing them will will, will um will bear greater greater fruit fruits and obviously have more success and obviously setting people back on the path to working and also to good health, which 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 John Ashton has referred to. And my sort of final point or question is, obviously Mr. Gordon came along earlier with talk about ADHD. It, 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 is that included in in, in this? Because obviously people who have severe examples of that it is a real problem. I'd have in a learning that is a learning disability as such. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I just wonder if that if that's covered because he was sent to autism Berkshire. And although there are over overlaps, they are two separate things. And I, I believe there are great numbers of people being diagnosed with with this as well. You know, there are a lot of people are undiagnosed, but in schools, Again, there's a lot of pupils who are, who are having that um, th those issues, and do they qualify under your category? Thank you, Paul. Um, did you um, did you want to respond to that? Um, there were quite a few things, weren't there? Food, food of thought, a lot of it. Um, I think yes. I think I think as a CAM service, we're sort of looking at our services and 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 what we provide at the getting help level and what that's going to look like because i think you're right we need we need to look at that that size that's a piece of work that's going on at the moment in terms of i think you mentioned about autism didn't you people being diagnosed in schools um we we won't be the cams ld service not set up to see children with just autism but if it was linked with an ld then that of course we'd see them 
I was doing about, but what, what, where's the distinction there? Because <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to get at is obviously, yeah. to, I mean, he's just, that's what I'm saying about the cross at the threshold. And yeah. the same with ADHD, which I keep sort of mentioning, but it, you understand what I'm trying to get at. It's, it, it's, it's a, kind of difficult to distinguish if you look at the two two things there. It, 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 I, I'm not saying you're not doing you know, a good job. It's just, no, no. Just I would expect your numbers to be greater. Yes. Yeah, so, well, so we're on. We're in our. It's just our third week of opening. So I think we will be seeing more. But I think we've got a specialist pathway for um, neurodiversity. So we've got the ADHD and the autism service. Um, and so that's where those children go at this point in time. As I said, I think we're, we're early days. So I think a lot of cons consultative type work at the start to unpick these cases and work it out. I know in in East Berkshire, they've identified sort of as an ICB that I think they'll still have a need for those children and young people who are sort of presenting with autism alone and not reaching kind of a moderate, severe learning disability level. So I think they're looking at what their offer is going to be sort of from commissioning. Thank you. And I can see that Helen has indicated. Thank you. So I just wanted to thank Sharon and Emma for bringing this report today. I think it's really helpful to see the update um, on, on these services. Um, these services are quite specific, I, I think it, it's right to say, and, and focused around um, particular pathways. Um, I understand we have got an item on the next health and wellbeing board agenda, which will look at CAMS more generally. Um, so I think that will probably pick up some of the issues that have been raised today. Um, and within that, we will also touch on the mental health support teams, which have, have been re referred to and work going on around those. Thank you, Helen. Um, I can't see anybody else that um, wanted to speak. And I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, obviously, incredibly important work. I'm aware that it's a very new service. I, my sort of question was around uh, barriers that you expect anticipating, but I think you've kind of covered that in you know with different questions. And the other thing is, um, for me, is um, how do you feel if the the service is going to be in place permanently? We've certainly been commissioned on an ongoing basis. So yes, and I think I think it's both in in the Bob and in the Frimley ICB sort of commissioning intentions going forward, isn't it? One, you know, areas that will be protected going forward. So yeah. Okay. That's good to hear. And again, thank you. And it's it's such in, um, important work. And hopefully you'll be able to come back to the the board again at some point and update us. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Sorry, didn't turn my mic on there. Um, moving on then to agenda item eight, which is a health and wellbeing strategy quarterly implementation plan narrative and dashboard report. And that's going to be presented by Amanda. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so today the focus is actually going to be around the narrative um, report. Um, so I'll just be running through the a few highlights of the progress being made across the five different priorities. With regards to priorities one and two, at the moment the focus has been um, on the community outreach project, which which we've heard a lot about, and all the fantastic work and collaborative work that's been taking place. Uh, so the meet, as you as you heard before, the meet Pete service as well as Reading Voluntary Action are working together to enable access to full NHS health checks uh, across uh, different community settings. Uh, so I won't elaborate too much on that because that has been covered in quite a bit of detail. Um, the only thing that I did want to add was um, the wraparound support that Bev uh, mentioned, uh, which includes onward referral through social prescribers, um, as well as additional support and capacity being um, provided by community health champions as well. So moving on to priority uh, two, again, this just links into the community wellness outreach program already. Uh, but what we did want to highlight is that this work um, also enables uh, us to gather additional information around um, conditions such as uh, diabetes and hypertension um, and other conditions that can be picked up um, or risks of conditions that can be picked up through health checks. Um, 
and that referrals will be uh, there are referrals taking place through the joy app. Um, just trying to pick out key information and not necessarily repeat what has already been discussed. I think the main thing just to highlight there is that it is addressing, looking to address inequalities, reaching a range of different um, community groups that would otherwise struggle to access these health checks, as well as the additional support um, that comes with them. So under priority three, uh, there is evidence-based trauma-informed parenting programs that are taking place. Uh, for example, the me uh, Mellow Parenting. These are now established and they're being delivered on a rolling program for families. There's also support being offered to fathers, uh, which has been established, and there are good links through the Inf Infant Hub um, established with maternity services. Um, and this is seeing consistent signposting of fa fathers and now self-referrals. So there's really good progress taking place under this priority area. Um, there's ongoing work to promote the two-year-old funding scheme. Uh, and this is being done with the Family Information Service, also known as FIS. Um, and they're providing childcare brokerage support to 709 families to date. Uh, those families are eligible for two year funded places. Um, the, these families, sorry, were, were eligible during the periods of the 1st of January to the 31st of December 2023. So to date, uh, those numbers have probably uh, increased quite notably as well. There's close working uh, established with children's centres, with maternity services, as well as health visiting. Um, and Brighter Futures for Children specifically has two staff members that are focused on supporting uh, families pre and post birth. Um, so the two roles are the infant coordinator and the infant family support worker. So they're working extremely closely with uh, midwifery, both in the hospital and the community. So those are just a couple of highlights that I've pulled out from uh, priority three, but all the actions under that priority area are progressing um, pretty well um, as, as previously reported. So moving on to uh, priority four, which is focusing on mental health and well-being for children and young people. Um, so obviously there's been some discussion around some support offered through the, the previous agenda item. Um, so this is uh, just looking at the wider uh, wider work that's happening to support mental health and well-being for children and young people. And um, as previously uh, reported, there are a, a range of different task and finish groups that have been established with the goal of supporting good uh, mental health. They continue to deliver well against key actions under this priority area. And just to name some of uh, a few of the, the task and finish groups, there is a task and finish group that focuses on Suicide Awareness and Prevention, and this is working closely in partnership with Public Health. There's a task and finish group focusing on school attendance and mental health, another focusing on inequalities in mental health in relation to neurodiversity, um, as well as one around trauma-informed approaches and therapeutic thinking schools. There are four other task and finish groups, um, but the detail of them um, is included in the paper. So as mentioned before, um, all actions under this priority area continue to progress uh, really well and are all uh, RAG rated green. Uh, so finally, just a, a quick highlight um, in relation to priority area five. Uh, this focuses on mental health and well-being for adults. Um, in terms of where we are to date, um, with regards to just a highlight level update, the mental health well-being group and its promotional work continues as previously reported. Um, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Group is meeting next in July, um, and the reason for this is to follow on from the Director of Public Health's annual report. Um, the goal is to be steered by what the priorities are that are identified in that report. Um, and at present, the Mental, uh, the mental Health uh, Group is currently reviewing a model public ha mental health strategy from Grampian to identify lessons for our own local system. Um, in addition, in partnership with uh, the Bob ICB um, and other Berkshire local authorities and Thames Valley partners, the contract for bereavement, bereavement support has been extended for another year and further development work on a real-time surve surveillance system is underway. Um, and then finally, the Reading Suicide Prevention Planning Group 
um, is uh, meeting in April with the goal of continuing to review the local action plan. Uh, recently, this has included a program that has delivered three suicide prevention first aid courses for frontline staff. So again, under priority five, a range of different actions are progressing as planned. Um, but as you will note, there is one action there which is still amber. Uh, and the reason for that is although we have uh, finished the dashboard, which was presented in the last board, um, the mental health needs assessment is still outstanding. And this is just simply due to capacity issues with regards to officer time um, to dedicate to finalizing that, but we are working on that. Um, so I think that's just an over overview of the progress that's taking place across all the five priority um, areas to date. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Amanda. A really detailed report, and it's uh, really useful to um, to get an update and where you are with each of the priorities. And um, as you've highlighted, there are a couple that are currently not met, and the work that the ongoing work. So that's really useful to get that update. So thank you very much. Um, thank, you, do I, thank you. Do I have any um, comments or questions from colleagues? Nope. OK, thank you. Well, again, um, always a very interesting report and hear about the ongoing work. So thank you very much. Thank for you. The report. Thank you. And moving on then to agenda item nine, which is the Better Care Fund integration update to be presented by Bev Nicholson. Thank you. <laughs> Right, I shall just share the presentation. Um, and this is with the assumption that um, people have had an opportunity to read uh, through the report. So it's just a few slides just to present the highlights, really. So um, the Better Care Fund Quarter 3 return was submitted um, and signed up under delegated authority uh, following consultation between uh, Director of Communities and Adult Social Care and Lead Councillor Health and Wellbeing Board, Councillor McEwen, uh, and was submitted by the due date. So we're on track with that. Um, an update on spending activity as at the end of December was requested um, on a subset of schemes. So anybody that will have read the report will notice um, on the quarter three return that it didn't cover all of the financial aspects of the Better Care Fund plan. It was a subset that was selected by um, Better Care Fund uh, team, NHS England. Um, we're reporting an overspend against the original budget for complex care beds, um, and I'll come to that a little later in the overview because that was quite significant. Um, and we will be carrying out an in-depth review of cases to understand what's driving that increase in complexity uh, and whether there were or are any alternative options for that support. Um, and then our Section 75 framework agreement has been agreed by both Integrated Care Board and Reading Borough Council, um, and the document was signed and sealed on the 21st of February. So uh, making sure that we are still compliant with the national conditions for the Better Care Fund. Just some highlight reporting. So this is as at the end of uh, no, of de December, so quarter three reporting. Um, we met three of the five uh, targets for um, the Better Care Fund metrics. The number of adults whose longer term care needs are met by admission to residential nursing care. Um, in the quarter, we met the target, but actually because of uh, high numbers of admissions during quarter two overall for the year we haven't met it so although it's report we've reported we've met the target in the quarter across the year i've left it at amber because of that um pressure um and then just some highlight information about the better care fund budget so at the moment it's a forecast variance of eight and a half thousand um, Reading Borough Council funding contributes towards the overall costs of adult social care services, um, supporting hospital discharge, reablement, physical and mental health care packages, care assessments and advocacy, um, amongst other things. Uh, and the Bob Integrated Care Board budget line covers the Integrated Care Board's management office costs and risk share and contingency. 
Uh, and then the cross bulb ICB hosted schemes covers out of hospital services. So the, the, the things that support hospital discharge, intermediate care services in our community. Um, and then the discharge fund. So um, at the moment we are overspent significantly against uh, the complex care beds line. Um, and that's resulted in an overspend as at the end of December of 365,640. Um, against an allocation of 249,000. So we've um, proposed some adjustments to our plan for next year, and um, we're waiting for the planning guidance to come out to inform those uh, that any further adjustments we might need to, to make. Um, but we should be able to share that information shortly. Um, and we're working with our discharge teams and colleagues to ensure early identification of those people that might benefit from a domiciliary care or living care package perhaps the support of technology enabled care, which actually is being used quite excessively, um, not excessively, um, quite well, you know, is, it, uh, we've got a lot of users of it now, um, which really would enable people to go directly home or more people to go directly home um, and be safe um, there. So that's uh, the report. So I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bev, for the report. Well. I can't see if any any hands raised. No, I can't say. No. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for the report. It's always really useful to see the um, ongoing work, and you sort of touched on the um, the amber rag rating covered that. So it's um, you know it's really useful to get that update. Yeah. And thank you very much for the report. Thank you. Thank you. So um, moving on then to agenda item 10, which is the establishment of a Berkshire West Health Protection and Resilience Partnership Board and um, West Berkshire working in, in Reading. And Martin White is here to present, is on the line to present, sorry. Yeah, thank Welcome you. Martin. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Martin White, Consultant in Public Health at Reading Borough Council. I'm just going to summarise briefly the paper about establishing a Berkshire West Health Protection and Resilience Partnership Board. Um, the paper seeks agreement and acceptance from uh, this board about establishing permanent governance around the local authority public health protection function following the pandemic. It's important to remember that the board covers Berkshire West, that's all three local authorities. And a reminder in the paper that there are legal duties placed on local authorities under four main sets of uh, legislation. Um, and there's a need to establish the strategic and mandatory uh, assurance functions, uh, including reporting to health and wellbeing boards. Uh, the board will be chaired by a director of public health. At the moment, it's uh, by the DPH at Wokingham. There's no budget and they will report into uh, the health and well respective health and well-being boards to provide assurance, coordination and opportunities for scrutiny. Uh, Appendix A of the paper sets out the terms of reference, uh, the membership of the board, the scope of topics are set out in paragraph 1.5. They're not uh, uh, totally inclusive. There's always something more that can be added on to that list, but it's quite wide ranging, as you will see. And then, then uh, paragraph 10.1, there's the annual work programme. The recommendations are about uh, seeking an agreement to the robust assurance, putting that in place and having it maintained to uh, receive the reports, uh, agree to a director of public health being in the chair and uh, acceptance of the terms of reference. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for the update. And I think with this one, we're just happy. We just need to agree yeah. the report. Agreed? Yeah, all agreed by the sound of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And the next agenda item is uh, the Community Health Champions Programme update. And it's Martin White again presenting. Yes, thank you. This is just a, a, a short report. It's an update on the progress being made with the Community Health Champions Programme. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's important to remember that the programme is only still in its early stages. 
We've got about 50 champions that are trained and active at the moment, and the paper sets out a list of the uh, partner organisations. You can see that there's quite a few there that have become involved and there's more to come. They've also uh, published a video. I've uh, found out that the link in the paper is broken. So if you've clicked on that and not been able to see the video, I do apologise for that. For some reason, the full link wasn't included, but I've sent the whole link to Nikki, who's, who's said she can circulate it to anybody who wants to, to see it. There's 544 viewings of the video at the end of February, and it gives you a flavour of what the, uh, the project is about. Uh, recently, they have been uh, looking at advertising a series of small grants, which are there to put some uh, resources at the disposal of the community health champions and the projects that communities would like to take up and see happen. Uh, and uh, they've also been lending support to uh, projects like the Community Wellness Outreach Proje Project that we heard about early on. Uh, the measles campaign, a, a communications campaign to drive up uptake of the uh, childhood immunisation programme, particularly MMR, which uh, is low in Reading, and a tuberculous awareness uh, campaign that's coming up, another comms plan that the champions have been involved with. And I understand recently this week there was a very successful International Women's Day event uh, around that. Uh, future reports will be able to provide more detail about this, particularly about where the uh, other small grants are going and who they've gone to, and what kind of activities they're going to fund. Thank you. Um. Sorry, thank you, Martin. Um, a really useful update. So thank you very much. I, and I can see Councillor Gittings has a, a question. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, well, question, I was just it's brilliant. You know, and what a great initiative, you know, dealing with going to community organisations. I mean, there's some here I'd never really heard of, and I, I didn't have my glasses. I saw, it said draft busters. I, I wonder what that was. I thought it said ghostbusters at first, or ghostbusters, really. But some eclectic mix of organisations. I mean, brilliant. I, I mean, going back to the earlier reports on getting health, you know, health checks, I mean, I'd suggest it's true there. You might sort of have a bit of luck as well with a, with a link up there. Because if you're dealing with some of these community organisations, some of those people, I know we're, we're specifically looking at people in high need, but within those organisations, maybe they will be but I, mean, I really like the idea of getting down to community level with this stuff i think it's it's a really really brilliant initiative thank you i mean that is the idea and i think um well rachel knows the full glory of the garden in reading um but there are some interesting small groups and small charities there and it's great to see them being linked up and involved in this yeah thank you martin um, yeah, it's a really, really useful report. It's really good to hear about all of the um, the volunteers and the, the ongoing work. It's, you know, it's really positive and inspiring, actually. And just to say as well, I did actually watch the video on YouTube. I found it. It's very good. I'd recommend everybody watch it. It's really sort of informative and good fun. So well done to everybody who presented that. And I think it promotes the um, surface really well. So I'd recommend people watch that. And um, yeah, and I can see Melissa wanted to come in there. Thank you, Chair. Um, Martin, um, as others have said, really pleased to see the updated report um, and the momentum that's being built across the piece. It's such a, an exciting um, programme of work and has been, and we've enjoyed really hearing about it in the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, I'm just keen to understand how we can harness, though, all of this energy and make sure we're, we're focusing and prioritising on the same page. You know, we've heard already today about the Community Wellness Outreach Programme. Um, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing, albeit we're coming at it from a different perspective and that real focus on local prevention. Um, and so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how we can just make sure that we're joined up. And whilst there are lots of volunteers you know it's still relatively small in the grand scheme of things so how do you target your energies appropriately um i'm not involved in it directly of course there are three uh, interim members of staff uh, who are directing it and managing it under um, dana white who's part of our team 
Uh, I think it's an important point. We don't want to dissipate and get under other people's feet or, or duplicate uh, actions that are already taking place. But I think where they've become involved, it's about lending that ability, as Councillor Gitting said, to, uh, and uh, as John said earlier on, to try and reach the parts that others are not reaching possibly. I think that's the potential with this. Uh, there is the potential there for the participants and their communities to set the agenda, uh, to set up projects that they want to see happen rather than what we uh, with a, an a priori agenda uh, have to go in. It starts off with community vaccine champions and is being uh, expanded to uh, asset based community development really. But yes, there is a point there about maintaining focus and it is early days and there's some work to be done to ensure it's put on a sustainable footing because the funding, as you know, has come from the COM fund to spend and will only take us into this next year. Thank you, Martin. And Rachel has a question. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, really, that there's been a lot of joint working with, and discussions with Dana around the champions and reciprocal kind of signposting. So as part of the CWO, organisations that are getting small grants, part of that offer is that they identify champions within their group that will then go forward onto the champions and the training that's being provided as well. Um, there's cross-referencing there so that it, there's a lot more join up than it, than it might appear on paper, but in reality, it is happening. Thank you, Rachel. That's really useful to, to hear as well. So, uh, Martin, thank you very much for the update. I was very positive, so thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Um, so we're moving on now to agenda item 12, which is the Royal Boucher NHS Foundation Trust Integrated Performance Report, December 2023. And we have Katie Pritchard-Thomas presenting. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Pritchard-Thomas, Chief Nursing Officer at Royal Boucher actually started in post in October, so fairly new. So um, I'll do my best to answer any questions, but I may take a, a few away. First of all, I just wanted to start with um, some good news that you won't see in the report, but you may have seen in the media and on our website, and that's our CQC maternity report. Um, we had an inspection in November and the report was published um, on the 1st of March with an overall rating of good in um, safe and well-led, the two domains that were inspected, and an increase in the domain in safe, which is really good. And we're really proud of our teams and our partners that we work with. Um, so in terms of the integrated performance report that we took through our public board, um, this is the December report. The trust uh, is maintaining its overall performance around quality metrics, despite our ongoing challenges and our impact from industrial action. With complaints and serious incidents reported in month as expected, and our turnover rate for staff for staffing and our workforce reduced positively for the seventh consecutive month, sitting at 11.5% below our target. The trust was ahead of trajectory, maintaining a lower number of patients waiting over 52 weeks for um, outpatient appointments. However, repeated industrial action is having a significant impact on our elective programme and the loss of activity that that's caused and continue to cause in February will continue to affect this metric. In terms of diagnostic waiting times, the trust remains behind the 99% target at 10, 10 and a half weeks compared to the six week standard. Most patients who are waiting six weeks relate to endoscopy. Although these patients are risk stratified um, through approaches which are clinically led, this remains a significant challenge around capacity and demand and the report details some of the actions we're taking to address that. In terms of ED, 66.2% of our patients in December were seen within the four hour target of 76%. And we've seen an increased picture, as you as you'll know, around increased attendances. We're constrained by our space in our current facility. And um, although we're continuing to mitigate that around our building works, which have been completed and our new older persons admission space, our new CT scanner and rapid lab, it's anticipated that these challenges will continue and they have continued. And um, some of this work links to previous conversations that I know 
um, you've had updates from in this meeting around our uh, Building Berkshire Together programme longer term. Um, reducing inpatient admissions is a really key focus for us um, alongside length of stay um, and continuing to improve that that work, increasing our same day care offer, working with our GP partners, appropriately signposting patients to services prior to arriving at ED um, and doing that through various comms campaigns and again working in, in partnership with many people representing us here but also in terms of our back door and promptly when patients are admitted, um, discharging them as soon as possible on all pathways um, of care. And it was great to hear earlier about um, the work with pathway three particularly, but where we think we've got a real opportunity is with pathway one, those patients waiting um, packages of care. They should be waiting two days and on average, they can wait anything between four and six days. Um, although that does vary across the local authorities. Um, our focus now as a board is on our new metrics and our new strategic objectives for 24-25. And I'm sure in the next health and wellbeing boards, you'll start to see some of those migrate into um, slightly different areas of focus because we want to continually challenge ourselves. So, for example, our turnover rates are going to move to a stability rate, which is our turnover rate within the first year of service. Our complaints data is going to start looking at our friends and family information um, and our care closer to home dimension is going to look at postcode analysis. So I'll, I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, um, Katie, and I can see um, Councillor Gittings. Yeah, sorry, it's a lot of questions. Um, yeah, look, I mean, really detailed report. And I think the first thing we'll say, we obviously thank the staff at the RVH for the work 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 they do and obviously it's great to see the great report on maternity. I actually had the fortune of going to the Royal Bikes actually as provided by the building better program, whatever they call it. We look, there was 40 hospitals promised by the government and of course it was just complete nonsense. It, it takes a long time to build a hospital between at the minimum seven years under the new standard being set and mostly over 15. So that was always going to be an idle boast because even now that would have been 2040. But it's challenging, isn't it? Because you've got kind of confined space. And so I went into A&E as part on the way through and it was a Friday. It sort of looked quite busy to me. And I'm probably busy in here. They said, this is nothing. And people were, you know, just about enough seats. So that's, it's really challenging. And I, I mean, it's good that the waiting lists are down because the national tie we used to be 99 under under former government is now down to 75 and you're hitting 66 so so that's excellent to see so i mean i look you know i, I think this is good and this is really good detail in here for people to look and have some confidence it's being 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 addressed i was going to sort of end on a on a good note i i don't know if this is true i saw you see a lot of things now on whatsapp and political thing being shared up particularly with the elections looming but there was a there was a tape for national table for weights for care across the country and in some cases these were shocking utterly shocking but, but what i saw raw bikes actually appeared to be top of the table i mean you know i know it's all relative but it was i don't know if that's true but it was just a general thing the raw barks was, was was number one so i don't know if that is actually is the case which we're proud of but given the many challenges that you're facing i don't know if you're right <laughs> The only thing I'd say is, like I said, the continued industrial action is a, a real risk. And we yeah, have, I understand and that. We I mean, but this was a table that yeah, we've done. I saw it. And, and we anticipate that we, the balance will tip later in the year because of the, de the delay that we're seeing and as patients move along the pathway. But we're trying to do everything that we can to minimise those delays and those risks. But that that industrial action, which would affect everybody, so I mean, sort of relatively. So would it, is it the actual case that we were top of the table broad box that's how it that's 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 how it was reported yesterday yeah excellent i mean look you know it's something to celebrate i mean thank you paul do you have any other um questions or comments no no well thank you um as you know councillor gittings um so it's a you know really useful report um it's good to get an update i mean good news about the um cqc inspection and you know thank you very much for the report thank you
So if we're moving on now to agenda item 13, which is the Bob ICB update briefing, and Helen Clark is here to present. Thank you, Chair. My laptop has decided to stop working at this moment, so <laughs> I'll just lean this way slightly. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a regular update report from the ICB. Um, I, I won't go through it in loads of detail, but the... the sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the key areas um, covered, firstly, to highlight our ICB board meeting, which is taking place next week. Um, board papers are on the ICB website as, as normal. Um, the report also sets out progress on our primary care strategy. Um, members will be aware that the ICB has been working um, on a strategy covering um, all elements of primary care, so general practice, community pharmacy, optometry and dentistry for some months. Um, recently completed a programme of um, engagements with stakeholders, patients and the wider public, supported by a number of organisations, in particular Health Watch. Um, that phase of engagement closed at the end of February and a report is being developed and will be made available in April. Um, we also have a further stakeholder workshop taking place next week with a view to finalising the strategy to go to the ICB's board for agreement in May. Um, that will include details and imp an implementation plan, recognising that the primary care strategy is intended to be an iterative document with various work streams over time. Um, other updates covered. The um, report um, gives some information about industrial action, which I think we've probably just, just covered off. Um, and then finally, an update on the vaccination programme, um, highlighting the work currently underway around measles vaccinations um, and also the next phase of the COVID-19 um, campaign, which will be a spring booster campaign for specific cohorts set to start in mid-April. Okay, thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Helen, for the updated report. Can I see if there's any um, questions or comments? No, no, well, thank you very much for the updated report. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you. Um, if we're moving on now to agenda item 14, which is the Berkshire West GP Leadership Group, membership of the Health and Wellbeing Board. And Nikki Simpson is here too. So. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is um, an updated report from the one you had at the last meeting where Andy had to um, table some information for us about um, changing the organisation that um, he was suggesting that he represented. So this um, just updates the board and has the, the tabled information attached to it and has um, changed the name of the group that we're suggesting that um, the representatives is co-opted from. And I understand that there's currently a review of public health going on in um, Berkshire and that when that has been completed, there's going to be a look further at the terms of reference of the Health and Wellbeing Board and sort of a refresh of that. So um, so that, that can also be considered um, for, the, for the future. Um, but this is just to um ask the board to uh, co-opt uh, somebody from the arch west gp leadership group and to note that if you do then that would be andy that's that's going to be their representative um thank you nikki so any questions are we happy to approve this detailed in the report yeah yeah okay thank you thank you very much Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, sorry about the uh, the last meeting to try and um, uh, give you a tutorial on the GP representation, but I think uh, it's, it was the right thing to do to get to the to the right conclusion. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be sitting here at the board uh, as the representative of the Berkshire GPLG. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and we're delighted to have you there. So that's all good. OK, well, thank you very much then, everybody. And uh, um, the agenda item 15 is um, dates of future meetings. So we just need to agree them. Yep. yep. And the, the 12th of July 2024, the 11th of October, the 17th of January and the 14th of March 2025. So they're the dates of um, to be approved. Everybody's happy to approve. OK, thank you. And I can see John on the screen, but not a hand raised. No, no, so, I'm just, oh, um, right. so I'll just, just ready to say goodbye. Uh, I'll, I'll, 
I'm just worried about missing somebody. So, <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, and um, see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Completely out of tune. I'm just going to go to the next one. I'm just going to go to the next one.